All right, good morning, everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Richard Washington and I am a program manager with the National Center for Victims of Crime. Just a few, few housekeeping items that I would like to know for anyone new to the Zoom platform. We are using a regular Zoom meeting. So if uh, you have any questions for any of our presenters or panelists, we do ask that you use the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom uh, control panel. During the uh, during the meeting, we will uh, try to have some time, um, but in between every panelist and presentation, just to go over some of the uh, Q and A. Uh, but we do want everyone to uh, include those in that chat box at the bottom. <clears throat> Any questions that we do not have time to address today will be addressed in a follow up email within a few days following the webinar. We will also be sending out an email after the webinar that will include the PowerPoint webinar recording, a link to the post test, as well as a link to the feedback survey. Because we are using a regular Zoom meeting platform, we do ask that everyone's microphones are turned off until you are in your breakout sessions. Now, just uh, before we get started, I do want to have a few words about um, our wonderful presenter for today. All right, Stacey Beers has been a victim advocate in the criminal justice system for the past 28 years. She joined the FBI's Victim Services Division in 2010 and works with domestic and international terrorism victims. Stacy's responsibilities include immediate liaison with the next of kin of deceased uh, victims and support to victims and their families following a terrorist attack, as well as providing crisis intervention to victim and families and serving as liaison between the victim and FBI throughout the course of investigation. In addition, Stacy is also a crisis response canine handler for Wally. Wally is a six-year-old yellow Labrador who was trained in providing animal assistance crisis response to crime victims. Stacy and Wally responded in the aftermath of the IRC shooting in San Bernardino, the personal effects return to the victims of the Boston Marathon bombing, the police shootings in Dallas, Texas, the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando, Florida, and the Route 91 Harvest Festival shooting. At the end of our uh, webinar today, we will also have a panelist of uh, community organizations and agencies. That panelist includes uh, Eileen Zeta, for a program manager from the Trauma Laws Response Team, Jeanette Peyo Ayala, from a Victim Witness Unit Supervisor from Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office, and last but not least, Jada Patterson. She's a Justice System Advocate Supervisor from Cuyahoga County Department of Public Safety, Witness and Victim Center. Just wanna briefly go over the webinar agenda for today. Um, Stacey Beers will be presenting from 9.15 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. Our panelists will be um, giving their presentations and overview of their programs from 11.30 a.m to uh, 12 p.m. And then we will do a, a Q&A session at the end from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. to 12.30 p.m. So without further ado, I will hand things over to Stacey Beers who will get us started for today. Good morning and thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Oh, perfect, okay. Great. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and uh, present this morning. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, this is my second go around with Cleveland. Some of you may remember we did this a couple years ago when we first launched this training. You're going to notice a couple new things and some of our initiatives. So I'm really happy to share some of those those things with all of you um, because you guys are part of the reason um, that we are are here, quite honestly, with a lot of the feedback we got from Cleveland when we first started. So as, as Richard said, I've been in victim services for 28 years. A lot of those years I've spent, I've been in the Bureau for 11 years, but many of those years I've spent um, in a uh, law enforcement entity, South Florida, Pennsylvania. I've done a lot of crisis response across the country. 
Um, but you know, my, my heart and my passion really is homicide, uh, child abuse, sexual assault, and, and victims of violent crimes. And so uh, I've spent a lot of time doing death notifications in my career with a lot of the detectives that I've worked with. And a lot of the lessons learned come from those experiences. Um, you know, it's not, we know that death notification isn't something that is really trained in at most academies. And so it's kind of on the fly with your training officer. And so, you know, really over the years, this has morphed into, okay, best practices, how do we do this? Now, Mothers Against Drunk Driving has the, the best uh, victim-centered uh, death notification training in the country. Most agencies uh, who are trained formally use the Mothers Against Drunk Driving uh, training, but also um, concerns of police survivors do as well for line of duty deaths. So I will tell you kind of how we got here Back in 2014, when we had the Navy Yard shooting in Washington, D.C., every three-letter agency descended on Washington, and, you know, everybody was trying to figure out, okay, who's doing what, and we're doing the investigations, we're doing death notifications, the medical examiner's office was there, um, but the bottom line is our victim specialists were there, and we were working with Secret Service, Marshals, you name it, none of them had training. But they took the lead to do the death notifications. And so we're driving out in the cars with them, trying to go to the family's home. And people are deciding in the cars, on the front steps, who's going to do this. That is not the best way to do this. It creates a lot of anxiety for, for those of us that are responders. Um, but you know, if we're not prepared, if we don't really know a script or something like that that we can use as a go-by, um, it really created a lot, of, uh, a lot of issues. And I can tell you that in the after action, that was really clear. It was uh, really highlighted from the families that the death notifications went um, really poorly. And so saying that, what you can do is you can Google every, any, any mass casualty event, and you can see that the families will tell people that the death notifications went really, really awful. Um, you know, mass casualty is its own beast, but I will say that because of the Navy Yard, uh, we were able to get some funding from the active shooter initiative that Congress appropriated uh, back then. And we were able to develop this We Regret to Inform You platform. It's an online platform uh, that some of you, probably many of you have taken. And what we've done is we've taken the Mothers Against Drunk Driving training and we've actually put it on a platform. And so saying all that, uh, we launched it in 2015. We've had about 26,000 people that have taken the training. Most have been law enforcement. We have had some medical examiners, uh, coroners, medical legal investigators, our victim advocates, chaplains, you name it, uh, social workers, counselors who work in this field. And we are going to be doing some great things with it. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that in the, in the future. But that's really kind of how we got here. Um, you know, we're always improving this. I'm always looking for feedback. So um, I'm really looking forward to this presentation today. I will tell you that one of the initiatives that we've started is due to the fact that when we get on site for a mass casualty event, our victim specialists are often asked to do death notifications because it overwhelms the local community. And so um, what we've done is we've started to build what we're calling trauma notification teams in all 56 FBI offices so that we have the capacity to respond if we are asked to do so by our local partners, be it uh, law enforcement or the medical legal community. Um, so it's not, the FBI is not in the business of doing fatality management. It's not what we do. Um, but we've been asked so often that we are actually building these trauma notification teams. The training that I'm going to go do today is based on that. And so we've piloted it five times in the Bureau. And each time, each iteration, we do make some, some updates. I'm really excited to do this with you today because it's the first time we're actually doing it for external partners. So I tell you that to look through the lens of you are the first pilot for this, um, for external. Um, I know working with law enforcement detectives, People are not shy, so be really honest in your evaluation um, because I really want to make it better for the next external group that we do this for, um, and I know that there's ways that we can improve it. Uh, I will tell you that it's a little awkward doing this Zoom, but I know that's the way right now that we're doing things. I'm used to being in a room with people and interacting, and so um, I'm going to try to keep the energy up. So I hope you guys have all had coffee. Um, I understand it was a busy weekend in Cleveland uh, with some homicides, so um, you know, I'm, I'm respectful of that. Some of you guys might be tired um, from responding. Um, but what I'd like to do is 
you know, certainly ask you, I know Richard said, you know, mute until we get to the breakout sessions, but I really want to get a feel for who is in the room. And so um, I'm going to go down the list. And if you could just tell me, uh, I can say your name, if the name is wrong, just I'm, I apologize, just correct me. I'm curious, I would like to know what department you're from, how many years you've worked homicides, and if you've had death notifications, if you've done them, have you received training? And so um, with that, I'm just gonna go down the list. Um, Eileen, I'm gonna start with you because you're on the top of my, my you're on the top of my uh, my list here. <laughs> you're happy to do it. So uh, my name is Eileen Zada, and I'm the program manager with the Traumatic Loss Response Team from Frontline Service um, here in Cleveland. And um, I've been um, with Frontline Service for, this is my 23rd year here. Um, and the Traumatic Loss Response Team started in 2008. So I've been the manager of the program since it started. Um, and yes, we've definitely had to do uh, death notifications. And I was lucky enough to be one of the people in your audience um, a few years back when you were here in Cleveland. Um, but yes, the Mothers Against Drunk Driving model is, um, has been very good and very helpful to us, so. Great. Thank you. We've met Richard. Uh, Jada? I'm going to keep going down in case I miss people. All right. How about Laura Camp? Hi, I'm Laura. I'm with the Traumatic Loss Response Team. Um, I've been with the uh, TLRT, as we call it, for almost three years. Prior to that, I worked in um, forensic hospice. So I have some experience with death and grief and uh, notification. You know, sometimes the people we're taking care of weren't living with or um, able to see their loved ones. So that, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lydia Johnston. Hi, my name is Lydia. Um, I work for the Cuyahoga County Medical Examiner's Office. I'm one of the investigators there. I've been in Cleveland for about three years now. And yes, I do death notifications all the time. Great. Excellent. We're going to pull on your uh, your background then. So thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Valentina. Sorry, I'm going to keep going. Uh, Jen Pirro, I know you're listed under me, uh, but Jen, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? You're muted. There. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'm Jen Pirro. I'm with the FBI. I'm a victim specialist here um, in Cleveland, and I've been with the FBI 16 years. Um, and basically, as a victim specialist, we respond to all crimes that the FBI investigates um, to include, like Stacy said, all of the mass casualties, um, as well as all of the local crimes. Um, and I've provided lots and lots of death notifications over the years and have received training both from Stacy and other entities. Um, which definitely helped um, in providing all of the different types of death notifications we've had to do over the years. Great, thank you. Okay, Grace Leon. Hi, I'm uh, Grace Leon. Um, I work at Frontline Service, part of the Traumatic Loss Response Team. Um, I have had training with you a few years ago. Um, Thank you very much for that. It was very helpful. And um, I've been part of the team uh, for, I think, five or six years now. And um, and uh, so I have done some death notification in the past. Um, I have, um, you know, my work experience and also my personal experience of uh, losing my husband to a homicide. He was uh, a um, police officer killed in a line of duty and um, which motivated me to do this work. So I'm very interested in getting more tools to better serve our populations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace. Okay, uh, how about Darlene? Good morning. 
Uh, my name is Darlene Averick. I am the supervisory program manager for ATF Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives. Uh, we conduct the death notification trainings also for our agents. We also provide death notifications for our victims, our surviving families, as well as our families of our fallen agents. I'm always looking for new information. I believe that you can never get too many trainings. You hear something different every time from somebody different. So I'll just be listening in. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. John Butterworth. All right, how about Wendy? Wendy Ricazzi, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly. That's close, it's Regency. Hi. Oh, Regency, okay. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm actually a professor of criminology at Cleveland State University, and one of my areas of research is homicide investigations, and so I'm tuning in because I'm very interested in learning more about best practices with respect to this part of the investigation. So I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sophia. Not hearing Sophia. Okay, how about Mike Grooms? How about James Samoki? We have Jeanette Palo Aleya. I think I'm screwing that up. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, it's Jeanette Pejot Ayala. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. I am the Victim Witness Unit Supervisor at the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office. Um, I really, we really do not do um, homicide um, uh, notifications, but we do work with um, homicide uh, family, victims of, um, families of homicide victims, and it's, it's very challenging, challenging either way. Um, but I look forward to learning more about, you know, how to work with families that are, you know, have had a loved one um, pass away. Thank you. How about William Pelko? All right, how about Toby Hanna? Jody Bacon. Zach Kasparovich. Kevin Paradis. Uh, yeah, my name is Kevin. I am a victim advocate with the Cuyahoga County Witness and Victim Services. I uh, normally don't do the um, death notifications, but I work with a lot of families of homicide victims through the justice system. Um, and I've been with the department for about a year and a half now. Great, thank you so much. Nancy Radcliffe. Good morning, everybody. I'm with the Ohio Attorney General's Office. I'm an advocate there. And I'm the project director for the Linking Systems of Care for Ohio's Youth Project. I don't do net death notifications, but I am uh, very interested in building my own knowledge around these issues. Our focus is children and youth in the state who've experienced physical or sexual violence or uh, are proximal to severe violence. So I have to hop off at noon, but I appreciate everyone who does this work and I'm looking forward to learning. Great, thank you. All right, how about Lindsay Appling? Kate Bennett. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we got you. We got you. Um, I'm with the Traumatic Loss Response Team at Frontline Service as well. Co-workers with Laura Eileen is our great supervisor. Um, I've been with Frontline for um, in this role for two and a half years. And 
would love the assistance um, or learning more about death notification. I just had to assist with a death notification for a seven and eight year old this past Thursday, and it was brutal and awful. And <laughs> I felt way out of my league. Um, so yes, this comes at a very good time because I fear I'll have to do more of these. Uh, so thank you for having me. Great. Thank you so much. Yep. Pauline Lewis. I know some of you folks don't have capabilities with your microphones, so I apologize. And Thomas McCartney. How about yes, I'm uh, with the I'm U.S. Sorry. Attorney's Office in Northern Ohio. Can you copy me now? Yes, sir. Yes, I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator, U.S. Attorney's Office, Northern Ohio. Recently joined the U.S. Attorney's after 30 years, retired as a Cleveland Police Commander. Excellent. And I uh, always want to keep my skill level up, and I thought it'd be a great opportunity to do so in this forum. That's great. Thank you so very much. All right. I know we, I think we might've gotten to everybody. We may not have. What I'd ask you to do is if we didn't, um, or if you don't have microphone capabilities, if you could just pop into the chat, um, the department that you're with or the agency that you're with and any experience that you might have with homicide, that would help um, just so that we can all kind of get to know each other as we go through this morning. And one of the things I'll share with everybody is that, you know, we don't always get it right. And so I, we, we put together this death notification training. You know, I don't want everybody to think that, you know, we, we've done this and this is by the book. This is the, the, the best thing we have right now. But as I said, we're always going through various iterations. And so what I'd like to do right now is I'm gonna share my screen and I wanna make sure that you can see it um, when we actually go into these, um, let me just see here, here we go. Richard, can you give me a sign that you can see this? Yes, ma'am. All right, perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, so as I said, we developed this training in 2015. This is a little bit different uh, than some of the things if you've seen this before. And again, really looking forward to your, your feedback. So saying that, um, one of the things that families have told us across the board is that they knew something was up. And when we get there, they can sense where well, we're not being honest or we're not being transparent. Now I say that to say, I get that all of us primarily work in a law enforcement setting. And we aren't able to say everything that we know because we have a criminal investigation going on. Um, we may not know. And so people can see through that. You know, telling somebody, oh, I can't tell you that because it's an investigation. There are different ways that we can say that without saying that. And so what, I can say is that I know when I'm doing a death notification, like the anxiety that I have goes through the roof because I know I'm going to change that person's life forever. We know and research shows that how people are notified of a traumatic death is how they will grieve. And that can take generations. When you think about children, teenagers, um, depending on the first time their, their death experience, if it's a homicide, that in and of itself is traumatic. But how we actually respond to them and how we actually um, do the notification can make or break the relationship with us. Sometimes in law enforcement, we need family members to help us gather information as part of the investigation. If we are not honest with them or transparent, or if we are not at least forward leaning with them, they're volunteers. They don't have to cooperate with us. And we know right now in the community, law enforcement and communities are, are not always on the same page. And so if we wanna work in concert with them, this really is another tool in the toolbox to help us get there. Now, according to the CDC and FBI, um, in, 2020, in 2020, the estimated number of homicides in the nation was about 19,000. We all know on this call, it has gone up exponentially. I don't have the numbers right now in 2021, but they're a lot, they're very high. I pulled the numbers for Cleveland and I think Cleveland in 2020 said there was 177 and there's quite a lot more uh, this year. So I think every major city is experiencing that. Um, and the one thing I wanna say is, you know, we started this training and we developed it based on mass casualties, but the most, 
commonly used, the most time we commonly use this is in our onesie twosies, in our neighborhoods. So when we have the homicide. So even though it was, it was based on mass casualty, it is not, um, we can use it in our daily, in our daily work. I have some statistics here for active shooter incidents in 2020. They were not so high because of COVID, um, but 2021 has uh, really opened it up, up over the floodgates. And so our numbers are up as well. So this is the actual training that we developed. It's an online platform. It takes about an hour to go through. It is a four-step process, which I'll highlight here. And just so that you know what the agenda is today, we're gonna go through the four steps, just kind of highlight them, give you guys a break. Um, when we come back from break, we're gonna put you into, um, we're gonna actually put you into uh, breakout groups. We're gonna have you work on a scenario and come back and, um, and, and really, um, train us and then we're going to go through and train the rest of the group so that you can see these real life scenarios and and really just trying to teach one another from our own best practices. We partnered with Penn State University because for some reason the FBI cannot you know cannot host external trainings on our servers and so Penn State volunteered to help us do this because they had a relationship with our office of partner engagement and they also had um a really good active shooter initiative, lots of videos, things like that, that they were doing in the college world. And so that's kind of why we went to Penn State. I will tell people that while this training was great in 20, 2015, and it's a great uh, four-step process, it's not ideal. First of all, it's not all overall culturally inclusive. So we are updating this. We're going to be updating this platform to actually include a facilitator's guide. One of the big questions that we get asked about this is, hey, can you come train us in person? Cleveland was the first group that we actually did this with many years ago. We don't normally go out and do this because there's frankly just, just a couple of us that train this and we don't have the, the, the depth in our bench, so to speak, to do this. So we've developed a, a, a death notification uh, facilitator's guide that will actually be put on here so that people can actually do these in person. So it's a step-by-step -step how to um, when, we, when we get here. So that's the first thing that's gonna be updated. The other thing is some of the feedback that we've gotten from our internal partners was, you know, you've showed us how to do death notifications by the four-step process, but could you please show us how it goes south and how to, how to figure it out? So what we're doing is we're gonna be putting probably, I would say three to four little video vignettes about some of the scenarios about how they didn't, they didn't go so well. And they're also teaching abilities to figure out, okay, how can we actually make this better and what, what would we do differently so those will be uploaded on here i'm happy to say that um the Cleveland area specifically asked my assistant director for an app to be built because it's great to take this training. It's great to go through the process. It takes about an hour, about an hour. But the bottom line is when you're going out to a scene, when you get the call, you don't have time to go back and look at this. Yes, there's pocket guides. Okay, many of us live on our phones. So our training division developed an app. We hope to beta test it uh, later this summer and we hope to go live with it in the fall. So thank you, Cleveland, because of you all in your area, uh, that voice was heard and it's gonna actually benefit a lot of different uh, agencies and folks who are doing death notifications. So those are some of the big pieces that we have. Um, we used to call this death notification team training. I will tell you that um, some of you may be familiar that in February, we had two FBI agents that were killed serving a warrant uh, on, um, in Florida, in South Florida. Uh, the Miami division had just been trained on how to do notifications for the Super Bowl the year before. They actually used this model to do the notifications for our own. Um, and the, the, the uh, Miami leadership who did this, you know, pulled me aside and said that it worked like a charm. You know, she hadn't done the training um, since our, you know, but she remembered the four steps and she did it. Saying that we also had four agents that were shot in that search warrant. And those family members had to be notified as well. So we've actually reframed this. You can use these four steps to do uh, a traumatic notification for a line of duty, you know, shootings and, and injuries. And so that's what we've really called it. We've called it trauma notification. So saying that um, this is where you can find it, but we're going to go through the process. There's four steps, planning, preparation, delivery, and follow-up. And we've really tried to keep it um, it, again, it follows, mother, get, follows mothers against drunk driving, and it really does follow the actual process. 
So the first thing is victim identification planning. You know, it's really important that we know how victims are identified. I will say that we are very lucky because we work um, with the Armed Forces Medical Examiner System at a Dover Air Force Base. They are the largest um, medical examiner system in, in the world. Uh, they have state of the art, their Department of Defense, so they have everything you can think of. Um, and so they will not release remains to us until we provide forensic identification. I assumed that you know, since we do that nationally, that everybody has that capability. And I was, you know, very surprised that that's not true. Obviously, it comes down to funding. I work very closely with the New York o OCME, um, and they don't even do uh, forensic identification. They do visual, which is the most common. Saying all that, you know, what we want to make sure, we want to make sure that, that the victim is identified. You have to know 100% certain because your reputation and your agency's reputation is on the line if you do a notification um, to the incorrect family member and or the incorrect uh, victim. So uh, the first thing is to make sure how the victim was identified and make sure it's to your comfort level of knowing who they are. The other thing with planning is team selection. We suggest uh, that there's a team of two. There's a notifier and then there's a support person. The notifier should primarily always be law enforcement or your medical legal folks uh, from your ME's office or your coroner's office. And the support person can be um, your, you know, fo folks from frontline, um, your victim advocates, chaplains, those kind of folks. And, and the whole point is, is that the notifier is the only one talking. The reason that we suggest that is when people are in crisis or about to be in crisis, they cannot hear a lot of things going at the same time. So they can only hear really one person. And so it's important for one person to be the voice and the other person to be the support person. You can have two law enforcement folks. You just need to pick a role. Um, so it's important to figure out who your team, who your team is. Just because you're doing this work doesn't mean that you should be doing death notifications. Now, when we do our trauma notification teams in the Bureau, they are volunteers, they are not voluntold. I realize if you're doing homicide investigations or you're in the medical examiner system, um, you don't have a choice. Um, I'd like to think that you signed up to do this work um, because you have a certain gift. And so saying that, you know, knowing what your strengths are, if you have made death notifications, you know, three back to back, maybe it's time for you to take a break and let somebody else do it. Um, you know, we all have stuff, right? We all have our own baggage. We all have our own histories. Um, and so if we have something that's similar, if we've lost a child and this is a notification we're doing to a parent, maybe we should be the support person and it's okay to do that. So saying all that, when you think about your team selection, you know, it's always great to have a cadre of folks that are trained so you have depth in your bench that you can actually pull from. The third thing is identifying where your next of kin is. Is your next of kin in your AOR? Are they in your jurisdiction? Are they in neighboring jurisdiction? Are they around the world? Where are they? Um, and who are they? How do you define next of kin, legal next of kin in your jurisdiction? Mostly we know it's spouses, parents, children, um, and so every jurisdiction is different with how uh, you identify the next of kin, um, but that is really important. The other thing is, you know, certainly if it is in a, a neighboring area, we always want to make sure that we know what, who has a jurisdiction because we are not proponents of doing telephonic notifications. I know that that is like the number one way people are notified. It is not best practice for a number of reasons. We have no idea what's going on on the other end of the phone. In this day and age, we all have cell phones. And so God forbid we're calling somebody on a cell phone as they're driving. We have no idea if there's medical issues. We don't know if there's children in the room. We have no idea. We are not proponents of doing telephonic notification. We talk about remote notification and I'll share that in a second. Um, but we wanna know where the next of kin is. I will tell you that uh, the app will allow for mapping. So if you, let's say, have some, a homicide in the Cleveland area, but your next of kin uh, lives in, I don't know, let's just pick Kansas City, you can put Kansas City in the app 
uh, mapping function, boom, you can pull up with the address that you're searching for, the closest law enforcement agency, the closest medical examiner. Um, there's all those kind of mapping capabilities in this new app. So I'm really excited to, to see how that works. And then the details. What is it that you can tell people? Um, I always say in mass casualties, it's fairly easy because it's on the news. There was a shooting at the Pulse nightclub. You know, your son was there. I'm sorry to tell you that he he died. Um, you know, mass casualties, the news really sets us up, right? But when you have the regular kind of um, normal homicides that most of us have experienced with, uh, the domestic violence homicide, uh, the drunk driving uh, crash, or you know, a shooting, a robbery, of whatever the case may be, you know, you might not have all the details. So know what details you have and know what you can release. Preparation. What are your SOPs? You know, who does death notifications in your AOR? I understand in Cleveland, it's the Cleveland um, law, primarily Cleveland uh, law enforcement, which is great. Um, in some other communities, it's the medical examiner's office. It could be both, um, but just know your SOPs. You also want to do research on your next of kin. So let's say they're in your jurisdiction. When I worked in my uh, law enforcement um, agency, anytime I had to do a death notification um, before we went out, I always had the address run for anything in that in that area. So I was looking for um, officer safety issues. I was looking for weapons. If there were weapon callouts to that address, I also want to know if we had medical callouts because. You know, first of all, uh, safety, you know, is number one. But number two, if we had a lot of medical call outs, I need to have medics on standby. I need to have them not in front of the house, maybe around the block, two blocks down, out of, out of sight. Because if I'm doing a notification and somebody's already had a medical issue there, I need to make sure that we are set up because the last thing I want to do is have to deal with that in addition to doing the notification. The other thing is doing, uh, knowing the emotional and physical responses. As you guys probably all know, everybody has different um, experiences and different responses to traumatic notifications. Most people say, well, people will scream and they'll yell. I've had that happen. Most of the time, my experience has been people are so stunned that you wonder if they even heard you. You have to repeat yourself. And so you know, really knowing the gamut for what that's like. I've had people, you know, that fight or flight. So doing notifications, I've had people come at me, come at the detective, um, you know, and I've had some, when I worked in, Pens in Pennsylvania, some of the state troopers would be like, if they're coming at me, I'm going to arrest them. And I'm like, listen, I'm not going to tell you what to do. They are having an emotional response um, to this, you know, to this, this notification that you're you're giving some people may punch the walls because they're angry you know what it's their house i could care less um if they're coming at me that's a different story um i've had people run out the back door run out the front door so it really depends you just have to be prepared for for, for really anything so then you get the delivery right so the first thing is you have your primary you have your your support the primary person and the support go to the door you knock and you make your identification. First thing you wanna do is confirm who you're talking to as a next of kin. As I said, a lot of this training is based not only on mothers against drunk driving, but lessons learned. Take it from this person. You don't notify the person that you, you answers the door because it may not be the next of kin. It could be a babysitter. It could be a distant relative that's just at the home for the week. So you wanna confirm the next of kin. Ideally, you want to ask to enter the home and sit down. Now, I know in a lot of our communities, people are not wanting law enforcement in our homes and nobody's sitting down. The reason we suggest this is because if people don't sit down, they may fall down. Uh, I think it's really important to, to prepare for all of this. Um, again, this is the best case scenario. I've had situations where I've gone to a home, they won't let us in, and here we are. Um, you know, do you want people to be embarrassed in front of their neighbors? Do you want a crowd control issue? Um, I mean, so those are the kind of things we're trying to avoid. Ideally, you do what you can. If they don't want to sit down, we're not going to get in an altercation with them and make them sit down. Um, we'll just tell them and, and pray that, you know, they don't fall down. Um, sometimes when we tell them they then want to come in and sit down, they're okay to do that. 
I have um, sat down on the front porch with someone because they didn't want to, um, you know, sit down, uh, let us in their home. Also had a situation where I wasn't able to find the person at home. It was a domestic violence homicide. And I knew that uh, when dad would be coming home, he would notice all the police activity on his street. We went to his uh, workplace and uh, he wasn't there. And they said he goes to a gym. So the detective and I went over to the gym and I said, we are really not gonna do this at the gym. And uh, we really didn't have a choice. We waited for him to come outside the gym. We sat down um, on a bench, which was again, not ideal, but we were really trying to save him from going to his community and knowing before he got there. So um, we were able to transport him back home after that. You do what you can in the delivery uh, to make it best and, and the most, op, op, you know, the most, the, the best for the victim. We want to give a brief overview of the incident and a one sentence delivery. As I said, people who are experiencing a traumatic event, they honestly um, can't hear a lot of noise. And so saying things like, you know, there was a a shooting, uh, you know, you're unfortunately your daughter uh, was killed in the shooting and uh, we don't know much about it. And as soon as we get more information, we will let you know. Um, we are so sorry. Boom, done. Um, you know, there will be a lot of questions about next steps. You know, some of the number one questions are, where are they now? Can I see them? Um, you know, Certain jurisdictions allow that, certain don't. Obviously, if it's a homicide, the the victim is, you know, is is they have evidence. And so, you know, one of the things that I've always I've been really known to do in South Florida, where I was a victim advocate, was barter. I bartered a lot with my medical examiner and I bartered a lot with my detectives. And I'd say, listen, I realize you know, they can't, you know, they, they can't see them, you know, in their entirety, but could they please see a hand? Can they please see a foot? Can they see something? Because you cannot tell me that a parent does not recognize their child's hand, foot, something. Um, so, you know, knowing when I talked about your SOPs, knowing what that looks like, you know, do your medical examiner's office, do they have the capability of, uh, letting victims see, next of kin see their loved ones. I can tell you in Washington, D.C., the medical examiner's office, it's required. So after somebody's received their death notification and the victim is removed to the medical examiner's office, they have to actually come there. They go through the process. There's an advocate there from our, our local um, WENT center, and they have an advocate that will sit with them because they have to make that in-person notification. Um, I do have, I do, I am mean, familiar with a couple of um, AORs who will take a photo of the victim and show the family. I don't get that. I, I get that they have to identify them, but showing a family member a crime scene photo um, to do the next of kin, to do the actual notification, I'm not quite sure that um, that is a really a trauma informed approach, so to speak. You know, we really want to give victims the control. We want to let them drive this. Um, so those are the, some of the next steps in talking about what will happen. Some of the helpful delivery statements, you know, when we did this training, I had uh, like a page of helpful delivery statements. I had like three pages of not helpful statements and I had to cut them back. Um, you know, saying things like, I'm so sorry. Um, it's okay to say that. There's not, there's nothing that you're going to say to make them feel better, nothing. Um, and so don't try. So saying things like, I'm so sorry, this may be, um, diff this is, this may be difficult uh, for you. This is most, this is harder than most people think. Um, you know, acknowledging that some people may experience different feelings at the same time. You know, it's all kind of things to, to let them know that what they're experiencing is normal for this abnormal event. Now, some of the pitfall statements, again, I, I, I really uh, edited this list. I know how you feel. You know, I've had people well-meaning who might've had a parent who died um, of, I don't know, a heart attack or, you know, cancer, whatever the case may be. And now this person has lost their father and, and their father's killed. Very different significant circumstances. We don't know the relationship they had with their loved one. It may not be the same that you had with yours. So we do not say, I know how you feel. We don't. It's just like saying, I understand. We don't understand. Time heals all wounds. We don't know that. You know, I will tell you that working 28 years now, one of my, the oldest cases I've worked was a serial killer um, in our area. And this month is actually 
you know, the 25th year, that mother still knows every holiday there is an empty space at her table. So time doesn't heal wounds. Does time make things better? It might, depending on the situation. But who, who are we to say that? Um, I had a, a state trooper tell a family member um, in a domestic violence homicide where the subject killed his two uh, daughters uh, who were two and five and his mother-in-law uh, when we reunited mom with uh, her two sons who he did not kill he spared them to spread his seed quote unquote the detective said to the mom you need to be strong and I looked at him and I was like are you for real right now because honestly um, this mother has lost her children her mother and she doesn't need to be strong and what we know is that when parents grieve, they actually teach their children how to do that. So when we say don't cry, the message is it's not okay to emote emotionally and it's not okay to emote outwardly. So those are some things that we we don't say. Um, I hate this wrong place at wrong time. Like seriously, where is that? You know, we are in the United States. You know, we have a right to be anywhere we want to be at any time. And so that does not really bode well. The other thing is, um, you know, this person didn't know what hit them. You know, they, one of the things that families often ask is how long were they alive? Did they suffer? That is the biggest question that we get. Unless any of us are forensic pathologists, we really shouldn't be answering that question. Um, I have been with family members when the pathologist goes to testify on the stand and they give testimony that medically that person was alive for 30 seconds uh, before they died. That might sound not sound like a lot for us, but I always tell people go home and put a cup of coffee in the microwave and stand there for 30 seconds. If that is your loved one, that is the longest 30 seconds of your life. And so we don't say things like that. I realize it's well-meaning and we're trying to answer the questions, um, but we need to defer those. Those really go to the medical examiner's office. Um, you know, a lot of times victims will ask questions about, you know, can I see them and what does that look like? And um, I've had a coroner in Pennsylvania who told uh, a mother, no, uh, you cannot see your daughter, you wouldn't recognize her. And so she buried her child, uh, you know, without seeing her. And that's very important to some family members. And it really bothered her. She went to see the coroner uh, months down the road because this is something that really upset her and when she got there she said I want to see photos and he said no I'm not going to show you the photos and it really became about him and his comfort level finally when she saw the photos there was nothing wrong with her daughter's face the injuries were all in her chest area and her torso you know that corner um really impacted that family's life. He made a choice for that family um, that he did not have the right to do. Well-meaning, he tried to protect them. It is not our job. Our job is to inform the victims. It really is to allow them to make the decisions with an informed process. And then certainly the religious phrases, um, you know, God has another angel, all those kind of things. Again, well-meaning, that's lovely. Um, you know, we'd like to have our angel here on earth to make more memories and that sort of thing. And sometimes people just don't know what to say. Um, so anyway, these are just some delivery pitfall statements. I'm sure you've heard some of them. Quite frankly, some of us might have said some of these before. And again, we're just all learning and seeing, you know, wh what we can do moving forward. Normally what we do is um, after we make the notification, we tell people, we tell the family, you know, we're gonna follow up with you. Um, so we're gonna follow up with you in 24 hours, whatever that is, whatever that time is. Um, in, our, in our area, you know, in, with victim advocates, it's usually the victim advocates that are doing a follow up, you know, certainly um, law enforcement can as well. This is really where um, they have questions about resources and things like that. They could have questions about media. The media could be intrusive. As you know, sometimes the media can be. Um, and so I can tell you from our perspective, you know, oftentimes when we have media that are encroaching, um, you know, when we had uh, our two agents that were killed in, in Miami, you can imagine how the media just swarmed to the houses. And so, you know, the benefit is that that's private property. So we were able to call our law enforcement partners and say, hey, you know, can you get them off the property? And they were very happy to do so. Um, but there's a lot of questions sometimes about media, often autopsies too. You know, what, what's entailed in an autopsy? 
as you all know, most people watch the uh, 60 minute uh, TV show, NCIS, figure, you know, whatever you would, whatever you watch, you know, and the crime is solved in, in an hour, right? And there's an autopsy and it's, it's, it's done. People don't really know what an autopsy is. And what they hear it is, is maybe different than an actual procedure. So what I always explain to the family is, is a surgical procedure in order to remove and retain evidence um, to help us solve the crime. And that's what I tell people. Um, and so some people may have religious considerations. Uh, that is not uncommon, obviously, in the Jewish faith, sometimes a Muslim faith. And, um, you know, it's really a discussion about what you can do. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the victim is, is evidence. And I don't want to be callous about that. We know that from a law enforcement perspective. That's not helpful to say the family. Um, you know, I can tell you in the Bureau that if our agents really want an autopsy, it does trump the family's wishes. Um, I, in 11 years that I've been here, I've never had to, to do that. Um, I've had situations where I've had a family member who, uh, family was of uh, the Jewish faith and they refused an autopsy. And so I, I kind of bartered with them and said, you know, well, if we can't do a full autopsy, would we be able to do a CT scan of your son and just extract those, the shrapnel and the bullets that were in there um, to help with, um, you know, the evidence collection. And I explained why. I explained that everything would be retained, um, you know, for their loved one um, and that we wouldn't do a full autopsy. They agreed to do that. And we actually got an, an indictment because of that. So we went back and told the family, thank you, because, you know, because you allowed us to do this, we were able to, to, um, you know, to get an indictment. The other thing is, you know, obviously with religious considerations, there could be situations where somebody needs to be uh, buried by sundown. And so I'm not shy to say that in Broward County, I would often call the medical examiners, investigators, and I'd say, hey, can we bump somebody to do this autopsy quicker? And, you know, get this, 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 these victim, this victim back to their loved one. So, you know, it's all those relationships that you have and that you build over the years. Also resources. You know, I know people think it's really odd, but one of the questions that we get often is how am I going to bury my loved one? Most of us don't have life insurance on our kids. Well, maybe we do, but most people in America don't because we're supposed to die before our kids. So when that happens, people don't generally know, okay, what do we do? Um, and so obviously crime victims compensation is a resource. Um, there might be also community resources. And so this is really helpful in the follow-up to, to really highlight. The other thing is personal effects. This is something we do an awful lot of um, in mass casualties, but as well as our onesie twosies. I work a lot of terrorism cases overseas. Um, I cover Africa, uh, Europe, and Canada. And what I will tell you is that even though they happen overseas, family members want things back from their loved ones, whether it was their clothing that they were wearing, if it's not needed for evidence, um, you know, some kind of jewelry. And so we have a contract to have it cleaned and returned to that family member. And so, you know, sometimes we can do that. When I was in the police department, our crime scene folks would help me clean it with bleach and everything worked out great. But there are companies that will clean personal effects package them, and then we return them in a, um, in a thoughtful manner. And so these are some of the questions and the highlights that we often get for follow-up. And for that reason, what we generally suggest is certainly it can be law enforcement, but partner up with um, somebody in your community that knows these resources. The post notification recap, I think is really for us, it's really helpful. I don't think any one of us raises our hand and says, oh yes, pick me coach, because we want to do death notifications. We don't. But I think it's important for us that we do this to talk about it afterwards. And I know that that's helped me do this for the number of years I've been doing it. Um, and so, you know, your partner, you're the support person who's with you, discuss the next of kin's reactions as well as your personal reactions. I can tell you the case like Sandy Hook, those death notifications were probably uh, the hardest that some of our folks have ever done. You know, telling parents of five-year-olds that their children were dead um, it's not easy when you do it over and over and over again. Um, stress reduction, we all have ways to reduce our stress. Some things are better than others. Um, but, you know, fall back on what your stress reduction techniques are. 
Um, as, um, as Richard said, I have a crisis response canine. He's a facility dog that we use in a lot of our cases, not just mass casualty. We use him actually in death notifications. We use him in court cases with crimes against children. Um, dogs are a great source of you know stress reduction. So if you're doing a lot of death notifications and you're an animal person, um, there are a lot of animal um, assisted interventions in areas that um, I think would be great in the New York OCME. We actually partnered with a group that actually goes in there once a month um, to let the puppies run wild and it really reduces the stress for those folks. And then knowing your resources, I think every agency has EAP, those kind of things to um, you know, to make sure that you take care of you. I've talked about remote notification um, and I wanna talk a little bit more about this. Our position is at no time should we make death notification telephonically unless absolutely necessary. Does it happen? Absolutely. Um, you know, do we do everything we can before the telephonic notification? Yes, we do. Um, and so sometimes it can't be helped. But our position is in this day and age when we have connectivity all over the United States and the world, you know, we want to make sure that everybody is getting that notification in person. So what does this look like? So let's go back to the, the, the scenario that I gave if it's Cleveland, and then we have a situation where we have a, um, we have somebody in Kansas City on the app or Google, you know, the location, you call that, lo that local PD and you say, um, I have a death notification that needs to be done, done in your AOR. Um, and my suggestion is that you offer to be on the phone with that poor road patrol officer who's got to go out and do the knock on the door. That way, your support to that officer, but you have all the information. And so the officer ideally would be great to, um, you know, would be great to actually go and, you um, do the notification for you, but you don't know what their training is. And so, um, you know, you walk them through the steps on going to the door, asking to come in, sit down, um, identifying the person that answers the door, making sure they're the next of kin, and then having you as the primary agency available on the phone to provide additional information because that poor officer isn't going to know anything um, except what you tell them. Um, and that's what it is. And so really, um, Remote notification isn't all that different, except we're asking someone else to help us. We're really lucky because in the FBI, we have 56 field offices. We have 171 victim specialists all throughout the United States, and they're all on call 24 seven. And so we can at any time, and you, you've met Jen Pirro from Cleveland, you know, Jen knows when she gets a call from me, it's usually on a holiday uh, and it's usually uh, sometime in the evening where we might have to go out and do one of these notifications. And so, you know, use leverage your relationships and, um, and make sure that, you know, we can, we're doing the best we can for victims. I want to talk a little bit about mass casualty incidents. Again, these are few and far between, though the media, you would not re recognize that with the media. We turn on the news and there seems to be one every day. Um, but in mass casualty incidents, each family should have their own team. When I worked uh, with the Las Vegas uh, shooting from um, the Route 93 festival, you know, the, the question from the ME's office uh, was, well, are you trying to tell me that every family should have their own team? So we need like 100 plus people trained? And my answer is yes, ideally, yes. Does that happen? No. But with this initiative, quite frankly, and, you know, doing this, uh, training for you guys as our first external partners. We're hoping to magnify this so that we can build trauma notification teams throughout our areas. So if we think about Cleveland, if you guys have a mass casualty incident, um, and let's say, um, you know, Cleveland Police Department is actually doing the notification because you have so many of, uh, they're doing the, the, uh, the investigation because others of you have gone through this training you might be able to offer your services because you're trained and now you can go out and do that. So I just say that um, we're force multipliers. And so really um, being able to leverage that if we do have a mass casualty. Privacy is a huge issue. Obviously after mass casualty events, what generally happens is people will go and um, they will, um, you know, everybody's in the family, friends and family reception center. Everybody's waiting for news. Well, you don't do it in front of everybody. You try to take people over to the side. You try to have an area where there's private rooms. 
I will tell you that not too long ago, I was out on a response and one of the uh, folks that were responsible for doing notifications said, okay, those of you in this room who have not received a death notification, raise your hand. And they raised their hand and she said, now follow me. And I thought, oh dear God, um, you know, not, not the best thing to do. Um, you know, we also know that there's on-scene convergence. So, um, you know, the research shows there's about six to eight people per victim that will, con that will converge on the scene. Do the math. You have a hundred deceased or a hundred injured you've got to deal with all those people. So make sure you have the, the space to, to be able to do that. Um, I will also tell you based on different, um, you know, ethnicity, different uh, cultural considerations, those numbers could grow. In the Pulse nightclub shooting, we had LGBT community and they were, it was also a uh, Latino night. So our on-scene convergence was about 12 to 13 family members, um, chosen family, slash biological family for each one of those uh, deceased. So it was a huge convergence on the hospital. The friends and family reception center had to be moved and it had to be moved again. Um, so it was really challenging. Manage expectations. You know, sometimes I'll tell you, um, you know, you can just basically say, this is what we know, uh, which isn't a whole heck of a lot. But if there's a, a team of people for each uh, family, you get to know them, you build rapport, um, you know, you might have to do provisional death notifications. Sandy Hook's a great example of that. And so is Parkland. We had reunified family members with their kids. And then we had this whole other group that didn't have um, family members that they were reunified with. Well, guess what? Their loved ones may still be in that school. And so they know as time goes on, you know, you might not be able to say with 100% certainty that your loved one has been killed in this event. Uh, but as time goes on, it's becoming more likely. Now, I'll tell you that social media is not our friend, as we all know, in mass casualty events. It's not our friend in homicides. Um, you know, with, you know, the media showing the license plate of the car or the location of the, uh, the address of where this happened. Uh, oftentimes, I will tell you that it's been my experience that we are often doing confirmation and not so much doing the death notification, the initial death notification. But frankly, I'll tell you that that's a problem because um, people get really angry at us. Um, we can't beat the news. And so I think part of our role in that, in that perspective is just to say, um, you know what, we are here to confirm we are not going to do a death notification and do it the wrong way um, without having 100% confirmation that it is your loved one. So a lot of times we take it uh, from the family members, um, but we do it because we want to make sure that that victim was identified correctly. Some key considerations, I touched on this, social media, um, children, uh, one of the handouts that we'll get when we develop this, we have a couple handouts that I want to share with you. If we were in person, I'd give you a packet, but one of them is children. You know, what do you do um, if you are present and the children are present? What do you do if the family members ask you to do a death notification to a child? So we have handouts on that. We have handouts on what it's like to be trauma-informed. Um, faith communities and faith um, considerations. And then of course, self-care because that's really, really important. So, you know, you have people, um, we have persons with disabilities. If somebody is using a wheelchair, you know, standing over them is not helpful. Crouching down, being eye level with them is really important. Elderly, you may have some folks um, who may um, have dementia, have some considerations that you weren't aware of. And so being able to, um, you know, be prepared for that. There could be language uh, barriers. And so making sure that you have um, translators. Deceased subjects is a huge issue. Um, you know, oftentimes we will get asked, hey, can you do a death notification um, for the subject's family? Victim advocates, we cannot do that. And the reason we can't is because it, it creates a really sticky wicket for us. Um, we are victim advocates um, and the subjects are, are not <laughs> because we're also VOCA funded with Victims of Crime Act dollars. We can't do that. Now, does that mean the family members shouldn't get the same kind of respect in the process? No, it doesn't. Because guess what? You're probably gonna need to interview the family as well, the subject's family. What my suggestion is, is you have a completely different team 
doing the death notifications to the subject's family than you do the victim families because you do not want to um, muddy those waters and you want to keep them separate. And so, you know, oftentimes we might have a chaplain go out with us to do the, the deceased subject. So you might have a law enforcement chaplain, a law enforcement, a medical examiner, um, medical legal investigator, and that sort of thing. Um, so just know that this is this is an issue, and, and we often get asked to do these things. International considerations, um, we have folks that live all over the world. In Pulse, we had so many people that lived outside of the United States. Um, really working those things were, was really helpful. And then the cultural considerations, and I've highlighted some of those. So what we're going to do now is I am going to stop sharing my screen uh, for a minute and we're going to give, um, I'm going to let Richard talk about how long we're going to give a break. Um, and then when we come back, what we're going to do is um, we will come back and we will do scenarios. I'll talk about the scenarios. One thing that we'll do during the break, uh, Richard and myself are going to have to try to figure out those of you who don't have um, if you don't have microphone capabilities, please pop that in the chat. I know we have some in here, um, but uh, for those of you who may not and did not you know, acknowledge that or, or indicate that, please pop that in the chat so Richard knows because we're gonna put people into breakout groups. Um, for those of you who don't have microphone capabilities, we're still gonna give you a scenario. Um, there is a possibility, I think you can dial in, somebody could call in. So we might do that as well, but we're gonna figure all that out while we give you guys a break um, and before we go to um, scenarios. The other thing is while we're in break, if you guys have any questions about any topics I covered, pop them in the chat as well and I can try to address them when we come back from break. With that, I'm gonna kick it over to Richard and he's gonna lead us to break. Thank you, Stacy. Um, so yeah, we're gonna take about a, a five minute break for folks to grab water, go to the restroom. And when you come back, um, we will then uh, have you guys uh, go into your breakout sessions. I will drop the um, phone call information in for folks that wanna call in. Uh, you can also utilize the chat box for your breakout sessions as well. It might take a little bit longer, but um, uh, that's also a feature that you can use. So we'll take the next five minutes and we'll come back at 10, 16 a.m. So Richard, we're going to have to figure out how we do this because we have one, two, three, four. We've got five from one department that don't have mic, and we have um, we've got two from Cleveland Homicide. I'm not trying, I'm just, I just don't know how we want to break folks up. He just dropped his phone number in for folks. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'd say for folks who don't have mic capability, if we put them in a group, if we put them in a, we put them in a breakout, maybe they could share phone numbers. I don't know. <laughs> so I was thinking we just do like random, like let out of like kind of like automatic breakout sessions. And then folks who may be in there that don't have phone capability can just use the chat or if they can call okay. in. Um, we I just have to might... figure out yeah, how you want to do that with the scenarios. And if we don't use all scenarios, that's fine because I can talk to them. Yeah. So I guess when we first come back, if you want to share the scenarios in the chat box first, and then yep. um, they should be able to see the... Yeah, they should be able to see the scenarios when they go into their breakout session. All right, now I have to figure out how to put the scenarios in the breakout, I mean, in the chat. So do I do file? Yeah, let's, you um, might have to. 
copy and paste it. Okay, good. That's better for me because yeah. it's not. Okay, let me just see. It is not letting me do that. That is, mm. Do you happen to have the scenarios? Yep, I'm about to pop that in yeah, there. Yeah, they, it, it's so weird. It's It won't let me, I'm dragging it. I'm dragging it. I'm trying to copy it. <laughs> giving me some problems. And the other thing I can do is I can pull them up. I can pull them up. I can pull up the scenarios on my PowerPoint. And for those people who do have mic capabilities, they can unmute and we can do it as a group thing. That probably would be the best option. Okay. If, if that is something that you I can. I just don't want to talk to it all the time. I really want people to talk because this is the, the meat. Yeah. We can just have folks hop off of their mic, turn on their mics. and. Okay. Can... All right. I can do that. Hey, welcome back everyone. So we're gonna change things up a little bit. Instead of going into our breakout sessions um, due to some, some folks not having phone capabilities, we're just gonna do this together. So uh, Stacy is going to share her screen and that will uh, kind of communicate some of the uh, group individual scenarios and we'll work through them as a group. So I'll turn things back over to Stacy. Uh, feel free to turn off your mics when um, she is speaking to you and, and give some of your feedback or suggestions and statements as well. Okay, as I said, you guys are the first pilot we're doing this externally, so we're going to just adapt. Um, so we're going to go through the scenarios. What I would like to do is I really want to please participate because <laughs> I don't want to talk. I talked for the first hour, so I would really love your feedback. And I will also say... Um, I guess Richard's monitoring the chat. So if you don't have mic capabilities and you wanna chime in, please do so via the chat um, if you don't have mics, because this is really the meat of the training. We've taken a scenario. Um, what we're gonna do is ask, what generally split into teams of two. What I'm looking for is really looking for people to think about what are the four steps? Like, how would you plan? How would you prepare? How would you deliver the notification? And what are some of the follow-up questions that you would anticipate? And we're not gonna spend, maybe we'll spend like three minutes on each of these scenarios. Um, but I do want to 
you know, kind of talk through some of the nuances, because this is really where it all comes together and figuring it out. I'm really using and leveraging your expertise and your experience doing these, these um, notifications. So this is the general scenario. And even again, even though it is based on a mass casualty event, the reason was we did that is because of simplicity, quite frankly. We wanted to make sure that um, we had something simple. Everybody was working off the same sheet of music. So this is the same scenario for each group. And Eileen, I did see your question and your question will be highlighted in one of these scenarios. So I might ask you to answer it. Um, so the, the scenario is an active shooter incident that took place at a, at a large complex. Um, there's an international delegation there, conference center, you name it. Uh, there were several local officials, uh, local le elected officials at the dinner for um, the delegate members. There was a bat mitzvah taking place with over 110 attendees. And then in another part of the complex, there was a native basketball tournament that was starting. Right now, what we know is there were 51 confirmed deceased and multiple injured. So I want you to think about doing the math now for the on-scene convergence. Some of the injured have been declined medical attention. Some have been going to area hospitals. The number of injured keeps rising. We've responded to offer assistance to the local investigative agency, but it's, it's not really clear that there's a federal nexus to this crime. So it's local. Um, and so Two subjects have been neutralized. Another one's in custody. The media is all over this. And right now all the deceased are being taken from the scene to the medical examiner's, the medical examiner's office. That is your general scenario. So what we're gonna do is what is different in each one of these scenarios is the decedents. So the first decedent is uh, Angelica Hernandez Perez, who's 22 and Crystal Souza Hernandez, who's 25. They're sisters. They worked at the conference center and the person who's answering the door when you go out is Sophia Souza Ryder and that person is 40. Sophia's father Juan lives in Honduras. So this is where you guys come in to, to play. What are the first things that you're thinking of? Um, what would you, how would you plan for this? And talk a little bit about what your delivery approach would be. So now I'm going to open it up to you guys. So you guys can unmute and jump in to either the chat or the, um, you know, or discussion. You can also dial in, Richard actually put the dial in information in as well. If you don't have mic capabilities and you wanna dial in from a conference line, you're welcome to do so. I guess you have to first figure out who's going to go out and do the notification. Yep. Right. Yep. You want to think about your team. And, you know, I think in a situation like this, would you think that perhaps it would be good to have somebody who is bilingual right. um, on this team? Yeah, that was going to be my next thing. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And Nancy's asking the, the, the great question. You're wondering if the sisters, um, and the family, you'd like to learn as much as possible, as fast as possible. Yep. And you might not know that till you get to the door, unfortunately. Um, one of the questions that often comes up in this scenario is, well, if we go to answer that, we go to the knock on the door and, you know, we figure out Sophie is not really the legal next of kin. Like, do we tell her? You know, and I said, listen, you know, I'm not telling you what to do. But yes, to Kevin's part, you want to identify who Sophia is and how she absolutely. So this is a million dollar question. If she's not the legal next of kin, would you tell her? This is Nancy again. I guess it would depend on um, her relationship to them still, even though she's not the legal next of kin. Yeah. And so that's a really good consideration. Now, the thing is, if you are trying to figure out like who's who in the zoo here, honestly, 
you may um, you may need her to help identify who the legal next of kin is. So if you show up, you identify yourself as law enforcement, and you know because this is a mass casualty, she may know that these the, that Angelica and Crystal work at this complex. She may be wondering, okay, um, do what are you here for? What tell me, like what's going on? So she may actually lead you to the legal next of kin. Again, she may, she may not. Um, if you choose not to, it could be, you know, you, you may not get any further. So you may need her. So again, we talk about transparency. You know, you want to be able to, to try to be transparent enough to get the information that you need to do the legal next of kin notification. Now, people say to me, well, what happens if we make the notification and she's not the legal next of kin? Listen, if we can demonstrate best practices, you know, no harm, no foul. Like we're really trying here. So I think the good point about this is that you really don't know. You've got to dissect this. You know, you've got, you can have people run the names. You can have people try to figure out who these people are related to, but you may not know until you actually get to the door. And so the other question is, Sophia may want to call Juan who lives in Honduras and do the notification telephonically. Um, you know, that we can't stop her from doing. We can always, we can find out is Juan a US citizen or is Juan, uh, you know, a foreign national? If Juan is a US citizen, we can work with State Department to have him notified. If he is, if he lives in Honduras, he's a Honduras, um, if he's a Honduran, if he, he is a foreign national, he, uh, you know, we might be able to work with uh, Honduras, em Honduras Embassy. Um, and so, you know, all of those things could come to play. Um, but this is what, you know, your support person literally can be like the person digging and figuring all this out as you are, you know, going to the door and talking this through. Um, you know, so, so there's all these kind of things. We talked about the bilingual piece. I think that that's really important. Be prepared. And, um, you know, making sure that, you know, you have those capabilities. And if you don't on your team, um, you know, how can you, how can you bolster that? One thing we want to make sure is that we don't use children as interpreters. So we want to make sure that that does not happen. Um, and we want to make sure that, um, you know, we have ways to communicate. So there's your first group um, of decedents. All right, second one. Hey, Stacy. sorry, before yes, you move sir. on, just another comment that um, I got. It's just um, not to assume that they may speak uh, Spanish as a first language, because that could also uh, become a barrier uh, yes. as, you're, as you're responding to that as well. So that was a comment that we had. Yeah, you don't want to assume. What we do know is, you know, unless we're told otherwise, you know, we talk, with, we, we use the language that they're most comfortable in. What we do know is that when people are in crisis, Sometimes they are more comfortable speaking in their native language. And so we just want to be prepared. And again, that's tra being trauma informed, being prepared so that the victims can take control in, in, the, in that process. Um, uh, Jeanette, you brought up a, an incredible point uh, because this is something that we see a lot is no matter what, uh, what cultural background it is, there is a huge issue with, you know, feeling of being deported and not wanting to cooperate with law enforcement. And there's that whole thing. Um, and we saw that a lot in Pulse. And to the point where, you know, we had ICE actually at the Family Assistance Center. And the reason we did that is because we needed so many visas to get people in country. But the word got out that ICE was there to deport people. And it was awful. We had to do a whole media campaign on that, you know, and you can't, mitigate people's fear. I mean, they're terrified of that. So um, very, very um, important point to, to recognize and be really clear about why you're there and what your role is. So um, I kept telling people the FBI is not in the business of deporting people. So that's not what we're doing. We're just trying to help get your loved ones here, but absolutely. And again, don't assume. We want to make sure that we're prepared. Um, and we'll be comfortable speaking in whatever language that that family is comfortable speaking um, speaking to us in while they're in crisis. So, thank you, Richard, and thanks for that comment. The second scenario is a 44 year old uh, county commissioner, and when you go to the home, a 60 year old um, man, Gary, answers the door, indicates that they live together. 
he shows uh, proof that they live together, that they own a residence together when you probe. And he also advises that um, Robert's mother resides in New Jersey. So you are not New Jersey, you are in Cleveland. <laughs> and so, um, you know, what do you do? So let's talk through this a little bit. Um, what would your approach be for this scenario? So I don't want to hog all the feedback, but um, I would I would want to know about Gary and Robert's relationship and and recognize that maybe they're domestic partners, uh, maybe they're significant others, not you know, and see if um, if there's a way that we can talk about yeah yeah what Adam said. Um, you be careful about my assumptions, but also understand that I may be speaking to this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What are some other considerations? Where would where could you get this information? Think about it. He's a county commissioner. Do you think he has a, a an online presence? Definitely. So you could, I hate to say it, Google, you know, to find out as much as possible. Yep, Facebook, you name it. Um, County commissioner, you guys might know him because you know he's in your he's in your community. Um, so you may already know the relationship between Robert and Gary. Um, so the question is, you know, is he the legal next of kin? Do you tell him? You know, what about going to uh, mom in in New Jersey? Like, what does that look like? Um, so how you know would you tell him, or would you get information about the mom and go? to and, and do as Sophia said, reach out to law enforcement in New Jersey. I think in a similar, you know, because this was a mass casualty event and like you said, there's a lot of media um, mm -hmm. and this person lives with them, it would be hard not to you know, give them some background about why you're there um, while at the same time expressing the urgent need to identify, um, you know, his mother um, who you might originally be looking for. Yep, very true. This is actually, this is a real deal that we had. Um, and, you know, we did tell Gary, these are not the real names obviously, but we did tell Gary and did the notification. Um, Mom did live in New Jersey and um, unfortunately mom had dementia. And so if we would have just deferred and not told Gary and gone to Martha, we would have had some issues uh, because what actually ended up happening was um, the state where this occurred, um, they did not recognize um, domestic partnerships. And so Gary theoretically wasn't the next of kin. So what happened was in order for Gary to make any decisions, Martha had to appoint him her power of attorney. In order to get the POA from Martha, she had to be notified about her son's murder. So we were able to work with local law enforcement in that AOR and we were able to do the death notification to her. She signed the, the power of attorney and then Gary was able to really do all the things that legally that that Martha would have done, um, you know, as her proxy. So it can be really dicey, but absolutely making sure that we cover all bases. The one thing I also want to highlight in this is that just because this is a county commissioner, this family doesn't get any uh, more information than any other family. Um, all victims are created equal. And so I know that sometimes in law enforcement, we kind of maybe fall into some things or we're like, okay, you know, we're, we're, you know, we know them or they expect from us, you know, they call a chief, all that kind of stuff. That's all fine and good, but um, we don't have a hierarchy of victimization here. And so we need to make sure that all victims are, 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 are treated equally. And so um, 
really important to understand that. And to Grace's point, yes, uh, consider clergy medical assistance because mom lived in a medical uh, a facility. That was really helpful. Um, our victim specialist was able to talk to the medical staff there before um, doing the death notification. So, um, and this was this was difficult because Martha didn't real, Martha, not her real name, but she didn't know her son had been murdered for probably, I wanna say three or four days because Gary was trying to figure out all the nuances of what, what needed to be done. So thank you. Yeah. This is Laura. I have a question Sure. Um, because I worked in hospice for a while. So yeah. did the mother, did you say she had dementia? She did. Yeah. But how was she able to sign a, a POA? So she had another family member and an attorney and they were able to work all that out behind the scenes. And so mm -hmm. they had all of that in place. So um, Robert actually had a brother um, that helped kind of facilitate all of that. So between the brother and Gary, they really worked it out to have her sign that the attorney, um, it, it all worked out, but she had to be notified that state was so focused uh, on making sure because she was a legal next of kin, despite the fact that we explained, hey, listen, uh, you know, she's, she's got dementia, like, how can she, she sign this? So, and then we had to get her attorneys, um, we had to get our attorneys involved. You know, it, these things are never easy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you. Totally. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The point that I think I want to make here is that you guys do the death notification, right? But then the victim advocates are the ones that figure out that stuff on the background. So you want to tell Gary, Gary would help tease this out to help you get to Martha. And then um, like for the follow-up, that's where a lot, a lot of the work gets done. Um, but, you know, no, no harm in, in notifying Gary. All right, group three, we have a foreign national from Russia. Um, we have, they were part of the contingency and we have a couple, um, they were, um, she was at the, ho uh, the hospital. Uh, she dies as a result of her injuries. You go to the hospital to do the notification. You're met by the hospital administrator informs you that she was able to speak to her husband before he went into surgery. You now meet him in his hospital room and he's not uh, been told anything by the hospital. What do you do? You bet you want a medical person in there to help with the notification. What are some considerations that you might want? Yep, absolutely, Adam. You may need an interpreter too. You absolutely may need that. Now, the fact that they came over for an, an international delegation, they may, um, you know, they may speak English. But again, going back to when people are in crisis, sometimes they are more comfortable speaking in their native language. Um, so, but making sure that there's an interpreter available as well. If they came over here as part of an international delegation, is there a possibility that they might have children in the hotel that we don't know about, that we need to think about? So we might go to do the death notification, um, but we definitely want to make sure that the kids aren't in the hotel because then we have an issue with child protection services. You know, we need to make sure that that they're engaged to make sure those kids just aren't hanging there by themselves. Um, so saying all that, um, you want all those considerations. You bring a good point, Nancy. You'd want to know how to handle um, sending the remains back home. And the medical examiner's offices are pretty keen on that. What I will say is that um, I would say probably your second call should be to the Russian uh, consulate or embassy. Now, all the embassies are in New York um, and the consulates. I mean, we, all the embassies are in DC. We have consulates all over. Um, I don't believe there's a Russian consulate in um, Cleveland. However, Google Russian embassy in the US because you're gonna wanna notify the folks um, there that you have uh, Russian citizens in your AOR, one's deceased and one is significantly injured. They will actually help repatriate the remains back home to um, wherever their home of final disposition is in Russia. Um, and they'll generally pay for that as well. So all those kind of things are, are really, really important. Um, you know, you definitely um, 
we talked about the the children medical considerations making sure that the medical folks are engaged um you know the medical folks may even do this um instead of you but you just need to ensure that it's done so really important to think about all those all those considerations all right we have a friends and family reception center the deceased name is robert a woman checks in as the next of kin and requests information about him her name is sarah she is a fiance. She's escorted to a quiet, quiet room and law enforcement is, is en route. On the way to the quiet room, you're advised that another woman checked in as a next of kin and is his spouse, Linda. She's placed in another quiet room. And unfortunately, she was told by the person checking in that another person claimed to be the next of kin. So um, this, is, this is actually a true scenario. And uh, this was uh, it didn't work out as you might have think as you might think. So saying that, what are some considerations that you have here? You are now at the friends and family reception center, and this is what you're told. What do you do? Yep, you definitely want a team for each each of these family members. Absolutely. So you need to have a ideally, you know, if you could, you want a team working with Sarah. You want a team working um, with Linda, and you do the death notifications. So the question that often comes up when I've done this um, with our agents is, okay, would you, you know, think about it legally if he's still married to Linda? you know, would you, would you tell Sarah? Cause she's thinking, think about it. She may not legally be the next of kin. And so those, those are some of the questions that we get here. Um, you know, I always say this from an investigative point of view, and I'm very clear, I'm not a detective, but these, both of these women could be very, very rich in information that you may need for your investigation, may be helpful for you. So saying that, um, you should have a team of two, uh, one team for Sarah, one team for Linda, and um, notify them both. And they'll be able to give, you know, the information and help go, you know, move forward. Now, what I will tell you is um, this scenario, how it played out is Sarah and Linda know about each other. Um, you know, some folks that I've done this training with have said, oh, I would never tell Sarah about Linda or Linda about Sarah. I would tell them that, you know, it wasn't, it was a mistake. And I'm like, then you're lying. Like you're lying to them. So just know going in there, you're lying. You're not being truthful. They actually knew each other. Um, Robert had been married to Linda for many years and never got divorced, but he had been with Sarah for like 15 plus years and they had a child together. So theoretically speaking, Robert and Sarah's child, who's a minor child, is the next of kin. Sarah would be the child's guardian. Again, I go back to saying, you're not going to get hung up if you do the right thing and do the notification, right? Now, when it comes to personal effects, when it comes to releasing the remains, that's a whole different thing. And that is not for you to have to figure out. That is definitely something for, um, you know, Sarah and Linda to figure out <laughs> um, outside of, of your role. But saying all that, um, you know, we we did the death notification to both of them, and actually, um, they were very supportive of one another. Um, they knew each other, so um, it didn't turn out the way that people, um, you know, thought that it would. Um, Kate, good question. Is there anywhere in the country where it's a legal requirement to have an officer be the one to give the death notification? I don't know that it's a legal requirement. I think it's an SOP. And that's the why I've said, make sure that you check. Um, what I always say is check with your medical examiner's office or your coroner's office to make sure what that you know, check in with your local, either county, um, county medical examiner or coroner to figure out what the standard is. And like I said, in Cleveland, I believe, um, Eileen, I think you mentioned that it was law enforcement. Um, so it's different in every jurisdiction. And that's why, depending on where you are, you need to know what that is in your SOP. 
All right, next one. We have uh, deceased, we have Kayam and Yante Jacobson. They were guests at the bat mitzvah. Their parents are Joseph and Rachel Jacobson. And they have three brothers and sisters, Mordecai, who's 15, Shamil, who's seven, and Janelle is four. When you arrive at the home, the only person there is Mrs. Jacobson and two younger children. What do you do? See if she can put the kids in another room. Yes. Do you think these kids might have access to social media? And she may just want to know when you get to the door. This is a consideration. The other thing is when you look at this situation, you want to make sure that you know if dad is one of the decedents that just hasn't been identified yet. Nancy, if I had candy at this training, you would have the whole bag. You are absolutely right. Um, you know, once you tease this out, you would definitely want to take a rabbi um, to with you if, if it was possible. The rabbi might be at the bat mitzvah, so that might not be possible. What I found is that some of the medical examiner's office actually have partnerships with some faith communities who were actually able to go out and be partnered with with those of you who are doing these death notifications. So you probably want to be really um, helpful to know in your AOR if you if your medical examiner's office has that. Um, because honestly, you you may have that and you can take them with you. Depending on what kind of um, faith community this is, if it's conservative, orthodox, there could be a whole game changer with this. You want to make sure that you have uh, uh, represent of each gender, a female and a male going out to do these, this notification, because if it is a conservative home, men should not be talking to the women. Um, you know, men, we need to be really careful about that. No touching. So you really want to be culturally competent with this. Um, there is a really good book that I've used over the years called how to be a perfect stranger. I forget what, um, what version it is now, but each each faith group is in there and it talks about customs and things like that, which can be really, really helpful. Um, but you know, you want to make sure that you know, like, is dad a decedent? Because if you're there and you do this death notification and you leave and you find out that the dad is deceased as well, then you got to go back. Like it's a, you want to make sure that you have all that information before you go out. Um, the other thing is, uh, there could be questions about the autopsy here. So in the Jewish faith, all, all blood, all everything has to be returned to the remains before they're interred. Um, and so they're going to want the clothing that their loved ones are, uh, were, were killed in. And, you know, again, understanding that it's evidence, but is there ways that you can photograph it so that they can be buried with, with their clothing because the blood is there? If there is an autopsy, making sure all the fluids are, are re retained and, and interred with the, the victims. Um, even crime scene, when we had the shootings at the Poway and the Tree of Life uh, synagogues, you know, making sure that whoever's doing the crime scene cleanup, like all of that is important. And if we if we can give a good faith effort that we've done this, it really bodes well and it can go a long way in really helping these families um, as they grieve. So all the, there's all those considerations when you're thinking about these kind of um, these kind of things. All right. Next one is Michelle Bloxham. She was killed as she walked into the hotel lobby. She is a leader and a member of the local transgender community and she was meeting friends in the hotel lobby bar. So what are some considerations and some thoughts about this scenario and working with, um, with her family? Yep. 
you want to look at somebody in the community, um, absolutely, Kate. Her family may not know she's transgender or absolutely may be estranged from them because of her gender. And so a couple things here, you know, her friends that she was meeting at the bar may be a good resource for you guys to figure out, okay, what is, what does this look like? Um, you know, who is her family? Um, how does she identify her family? If there's an estrangement, chosen family versus biological family and really figuring out, okay, who, who has to be notified? Um, you know, if you go to meet her biological family and do the notification, they may not know she's transgender. They may not, they may not even refer to her as her and may refer to her as him and, you know, being prepared for all of that. And so absolutely working with other community folks um, in this transgender, in your local transgender community in order to figure out, all right, what, what will this look like? Um, how can I best prepare? And I think the theme in all these is really thinking about the planning and preparation you cannot put enough time and energy into the planning and preparation. Now I realize you can't take days, but I'm hoping that highlighting some of these scenarios really gives you a flavor of some of the things that um, you may encounter. They're not all inclusive, but you know, at least thinking about, okay, if this happened, you know, what does this look like? The next one here, um, and this gets to you, Eileen, and I might, I might call on you for this one. So you have a situation where you have Sophia who's deceased and you, when you arrive at a residence, a man answering the door identifies himself as the father. There's alcohol in his breath, his eyes are bloodshot and he's slurring his words. A woman identifying herself as the mother comes out of a nearby room and Mr. Palmer shouts at her to get back in the room. She's visibly upset and wants to know what's going on. So you've walked into this house with a possible domestic violence situation and alcohol. So, how do you approach this? My, my thought is, you know, if there's, if, if it's only a team of two um, and it feels safe to separate, um, I, you know, might try to separate the two and just kind of say, I am going to, meet with you and so-and-so was going to meet with the, you know, other person. I mean, obviously if he would become combative or threatening or anything like that, that, you know, what has to be done is done. And sometimes that happens on scenes as sad as it is. Um, but everybody needs to be safe, you know, when, when you're saying that, but um, certainly if you walked in on another situation or, you know, potentially another crime going on, um, it's important to know that before stepping out, but I would definitely try to tell both and, and hopefully have her separate from him. Um, so if there's anything else that she needs to talk about. Yep. I think that's a really good approach. Um, this is a real deal that I had in a suicide. When I had to go do a notification with the detective, it was just him and I, um, he called for backup. You know, we don't want to have the troops descend, but this could be an officer safety issue. Mm -hmm. So um, you separate them. Um, and you know, you do the notification. Now, some people have said, well, I wouldn't do the notification until you sobered up. And I'm like, well, that's great, but that could be like the next day. Um, so what, you don't tell her, like, <laughs> why should she be punished about, you know, about this? So, um, you know, my suggestion is, you know, we, we told them both separately. I was able to do a needs assessment to find out if she was safe in her home. Um, we actually transported her to a friend that evening because uh, she did not want to be with him. Um, I was concerned about him being home by himself intoxicated <clears throat> for his you know, personal welfare. Um, and so we did welfare checks through the night uh, with him. But um, you know, this, was, this is potentially a, a bad situation. When we ran this address, there were no weapon calls in this home and there was no domestic violence. Now saying that, you know, if you get there and you have a situation where <clears throat> there's a protection order um, you know, you've got a whole other situation. The other thing is if there's a child in this home and you see that, you may not be able to leave that child in the home <laughs> because it could be a child protection issue. Um, and I mean, all of this, you know, you have to kind of figure that piece out. And so you definitely want to separate them. 
talk with them, you know, now he could be really volatile and not want you to separate uh, them. I've also had people say, well, we're not going to do the notification. We'll come back in like two hours. Okay, that's great. So here's the situation. You do that. He may think that she called the police on him and now it's a worse situation. So again, this is always easy to talk about in scenarios. And that's why we were using real ones to kind of talk about what happened and kind of how these all ended up and the best, best case scenario. Um, because, you know, we did not want her to feel like you know, she, she could be victimized if she hadn't been already because he was intoxicated and it was a domestic violence situation. So um, we told them, took her to a friend's house, um, were able to um, tell dad and do welfare checks with him, um, you know, through the night and it all, and it all did work out. Um, so he was not, this was just like a one-off for him. Um, and Nancy asked, does media ever hold off given the need to figure this out? Oh, no, they don't. Now, I will say that um, oftentimes the folks who have the, next, the victim list, so it's often local law enforcement or the medical examiner, when they're asked for the list of victims, most of the times it's my experience that they will not um, give the list out or, or, or all the victim names until all next of kin are notified. That's generally a best practice. And so that is definitely something that we support. Uh, victims should not be finding out about their loved one's death in, in the media. Um, so, but they are not often uh, helpful in that. They want the story and they are, they are there. We all know sometimes I'm not trying to pick on the media, but sometimes they can, they want to solve the crime before we, we do. <laughs> so um, sometimes they're great um, resources as well, helping us find next of kin sometimes. Um, but generally the names of victims are not released until the notifications have been made. Okay, so uh, the next one is Harold Hall. Um, as you approach the residence of Harold's parents, a neighbor runs out to meet you. He tells you that Harold's father died in a car accident two years ago. Harold and his mother were the only support for one another after this tragic accident. So you're on your way, you're going to tell Harold's mom and you now find out that the only surviving folks that they really had was each other after a traumatic incident, you know, two years ago. So what are your thoughts about this? Um, you need to be prepared not to leave her alone after this happens and that maybe one of the two, maybe the support person is going to need to figure out how to stay and figure out who might be able to connect, whether it's the neighbor or someone else. But it's important to know that this is not going to be a quick 10 minute one where you can tell them and leave. <laughs> yep. so. And that, you bring up a really good point because we never want to let victims alone after a death notification ever. You know, we generally want to find out if there's someone that can come be with them, whether it's a friend, uh, whether it's a neighbor that they trust, whether, um, you know, they have a situation where, um, you know, maybe it's a clergy member, who knows, you want to find somebody. And if not, you know, this is where your support person or your victim advocate is sitting with them, because you just don't want to let them alone. Now, we've had certain circumstances where they don't want law enforcement there and they want you out of their house. Well, what are you gonna do? You can't force yourself. What I would do is sit outside my car, <laughs> you know, and really just try to respect, obviously respect what they're asking me to do, but letting them know that I would be here for support and trying to, to check in. Um, Laura, good point, trying to find other supporters in our life, you know, who they are, who are they? Um, this was a real deal that we had um, and we did the death notification to mom. And the mom, um, you know, was definitely able to, uh, you know, she, she was really able to focus on the notification. One thing that we found is that Faith was a huge uh, plus in her life. And so she was able to identify somebody from her church and uh, we were able to call them to come and support her. And she is doing really, really well. And it's just her now. Um, you know, Sophia, you bring up a really good point. Would it be appropriate to incorporate the neighbor in the notification? Maybe they were close friends. Maybe they were looky-loos. So you don't know. Maybe what I would do is do the notification. Let her know that 
you know, you have the neighbor that would like to come and support her, you will get a real bird's eye view if you, um, you know, have, have done that. Uh, you know, if, if she might be like, no, I don't know that neighbor. I don't like that neighbor, whatever the case may be. So, um, you know, asking her again, when we think about a trauma-informed approach, the trauma-informed approach is really giving someone that control and power. Um, you know, letting them make the choices. Where can, can we, can we sit down? Um, where would you like to sit? Um, who would you like us for, for us to call? Um, are there any questions that you have for me? Even if you cannot answer the questions, you know, letting them know, I don't have the answer for you right now on that. However, you know, I'll work to get it. Or, you know, instead of saying it's a criminal investigation and we can't help you with that, you know, letting folks know, um, we're still trying to tease all this out. When and if we're able to tell you this information, we'll do our very best. Um, the whole point of this is you never want people to get information you know, if through the media. It, it really, you want them to get the information from you as a trusted agent. Um, so, you know, good question. I'm gonna skip, let's just see. I'm gonna go into the last one. So deceased name is Mahogany Pool. She was killed inside the hotel lobby. Once you obtain her address, it sounds familiar to you. And you realize that Miss Poole, that you know Miss Poole and her family. So, you know, when we think about this, you know, I want to throw this out that we've had this scenario in there primarily because, you know, there's some people in our community that we know, right? We know because we've been to their house before, either in a helping mode or an enforcement mode. Uh, so something, this may be positive and it may not be so positive. It really depends. Um, so saying all that, um, you know, there could be, it could be a plus and a minus. Um, this could be a family friend. It could be somebody that you know personally. And so should you be the best person to do this? And that really is what this gets to. Um, we talk about this scenario. And then when we had um, our line of duty deaths in Miami, this brought up a whole different issue. Um, and as I've trained this around the Bureau, I've had a lot of folks come up to me, specifically folks on SWAT saying, you know, I, I don't know that I'd want anybody to do the notification in leadership. I would want X, Y, Z. Um, and so I will tell you that, you know, there's pluses and minuses to that. And we wanna, you know, be sensitive to that. You know, in my old department, um, the SWAT guys, we would have like a, we had like a little form that was filled out who they would want to notify their next of kin if something happened to them. And it was locked in a safe in our chief's office and hoping that we never needed to, to use it. I don't think we have that in the bureau. Um, but saying that, you know, it was really hard for the friends of the agents that they worked with every day not to go and tell the family members because they knew they'd want to hear it from them. However, I will say that, you know, a lot of times we know that people will, um, people will oftentimes um, not, they might, they may be cued back to the time of the death notification when they hear that voice that gave them the death notification, right? So if you're a family friend and you did the death notification, then you show up for like a Sunday afternoon barbecue, your voice could take them back to that time. So having somebody do it and do the actual notification and be that lead person could be really helpful. And you could be the support person because then you can actually help them going forward. The other thing is, I will tell you that, you know, we often talk about trigger events. I don't um, use that word anymore because I, with all the, um, when we have a lot of um, gun violence and things like that, I don't use the word trigger events because, um, you know, I don't think it's helpful for people and it, you know, it, with the gun violence and weapons, it's just not a good thing, uh, especially an active shooter incident. So we talk about them as being cues, um, psychological cues and things like that. So saying all that, those are our scenarios and I hope they were helpful. We did them a little different this time. Normally what we do is we put you into breakout groups and we give you about 10 minutes to kind of tease it out. And then you come back and that you, um, you, you, you train, train us. And then we all provide some feedback. So thank you guys for those of you who participated in this um, and really tried to help uh, tease this out for everybody. Um, just a couple suggestions um, when we're talking about, you know, 
mass casualty events. And these could be, um, I mean, I, I was saying to Richard before we started that we had, um, Miami has had two um, large scale shootings in the past two weeks. It's been handled by um, Miami PD. Um, so, I mean, they are dealing with a community that is really um, dealing with an awful lot right now. And so one of the things, suggestions for communities and people going through this is, you know, having regular updates from officials from an official source is really, really helpful. Making sure that they're not getting the information from the media, they're getting it from you. I talked about the releasing of names, uh, making sure that all the next of kin are confirmed, notified before the names are released of the decedents. Um, one of the things we've learned is if you have a mass casualty event and you have people milling about together, you want to separate next of kin from law enforcement. We've had several situations where we had some of our SWAT team folks um, from our local law enforcement partners show up to help. Um, you know, they had their BDUs on, they had all that. Some of them had, you know, shirts on, maybe with um, like guns on it, whatever. You know, we all wear the tactical kind of uh, t shirts sometimes. Not helpful in an active shooter situation. And I said to one of our TFOs, I'm like, would you mind changing your shirt? <laughs> um, so, you have that situation. We also had a case where um, we had, you know, coffee brought in, there was different food brought in. And so next to kin and law enforcement were together in that area. Um, and then when the death notifications had to be made, the same law enforcement officers who were in that space with the next of kin were really, um, you know, really in a disadvantage. They, they really, they, they were kind of, they built rapport, but the next of kin said, you know, you knew this whole time and you were just waiting for confirmation and you had the nerve to sit here and drink coffee with us and almost have fellowship with us and you didn't tell us. Um, there was a lot of anger there. And so I always suggest have separate areas, have the next of kin in some area, and then you have your coffee area and some place to eat outside of um, the visual of the next of kin, you know, so that you can separate that. I've talked about remote notifications and I've talked about the benefit of having um, trained teams. So saying that, that does it for our, um, that does it for our training and our, our slide deck. Um, I'd like to open it up to all of you guys to see if you have any um, questions, any comments, anything that I didn't cover. I do wanna talk, um, Eileen, you had brought up the parents not being on speaking terms. Um, Yes, that happens. And I think the best scenario for that is to have two separate teams for each family, each of the next of kin, because mom and dad have the right to the information, um, but don't put one team in the middle of that. You don't wanna have one team be the voice for both. So you wanna definitely make sure that um, you have, uh, mom has a team, dad has a team and that your teams are talking so that you know that you're doing the notifications and any kind of follow-up for uh, these families really should come from um, each team um, at the same time. So you need to synchronize that would be really, really helpful. So that was my suggestion with um, the parents not being on speaking terms. It happens very frequently as those of you who do death notifications, I'm sure are aware so. Um, any questions, comments, thoughts? I don't know, Richard, if you have any in the Q&A. Yeah, we got a couple earlier. Uh, okay. The first one is uh, families that are going through the criminal justice system often ask to see photos and videos of the yep. last minutes. What is the best approach to handle this situation? The best approach to handling that situation is, um, you know, obviously making sure with the investigators and the prosecution that you are permitted to do that because it is evidence. Um, my suggestion is always do it before they see it in a courtroom. It's not a good thing to have them, even if it's the day before, even if it's evidence, let them see it before um, it's shown in court so that they can have their response. And they also will know from an informed approach if they really want to, to see it in court. That's the first thing. The second thing is, let's say they want to see it. <clears throat> you should obviously see them first. Um, when it comes to photos, you want to organize them um, from least um, graphic to most graphic so that at any point in time as you're going through the photo deck, they can say, you know what, stop, I don't wanna see anymore. So for example, if I'm working a homicide and um, you know the, remain, the victim is deceased in the street, I might do a, a 20 foot view, right? So you can just see a little bit of the shape. 
and then a little bit closer. And so, you know, you, you just kind of um, take it, I want to say less offensive, less hurtful to the one that you know will be most impactful. Um, so that's what I would suggest. You can tell, you set up the, the, the rules in advance, you know, listen, you can stop at any time. Just tell me to stop when it's video. It's really hard. Make sure you run your video and you practice because you don't want to be fumbling about trying to hit the stop button. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, you know, one of the things that families tell us is they want to know and they want to see, right? Because what we know is oftentimes their imagination may be far more worse than it is. Um, if that's possible. And so showing them gives them power. Um, I am not a fan of jurisdictions that say, no, absolutely not. I had a district attorney curse me out when I told a family they could do it. That's why I said, always check with your prosecutor. Um, and I'm like, you know what? This isn't like, this isn't for you to decide for them. If it's an investigative thing, that's one thing. But for you to think that they can't handle it, any parent who's lost a child um, for them to get up and, and, you know, be able to function the next morning, to me, that that is strength. And we just need to make sure that we're giving them an informed process and make sure that uh, we, we have them in control. So that's what I would suggest with that. When it is part, particularly graphic, but media may get details, how much to share at a time of notification. You may want to let them know that the media has um, footage that you can't vet the footage um, and that they may choose not to watch the media, especially kids. Um, <clears throat> and that there may be a time if they wish to see um, some of the, 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 um, the official photos or the official video taken that you may be able to organize that. Cause you wanna kind of stress that the media doesn't have the official investigative um, <clears throat> information, if that helps. Stacey, we have another question that I believe was answered earlier, but it may be nice to just touch on it briefly again. Uh, the question is, is there anywhere in the country where law enforcement is required legally to do the death notification? Yeah, that's that's the question I answer, but you definitely check with your, um, I would definitely reach out to your medical examiner office and ask um, in your jurisdiction what that is, because you know, it really varies depending on jurisdictions because of the SOPs that people have. Um, but I don't know that it's a legal requirement. Where you get in the legalities is a legal next of kin, but that really doesn't mean about death notifications. Um, and I go back to New York because they're so different, but you know, most in most jurisdictions that I'm familiar with, like the legal next of kin has to claim the victim, right? <laughs> you know, the legal next of kin has to make the decisions about funeral and all that kind of stuff. Well, in New York, they allow anybody. So if I had a friend who died in New York, I could call the ME's office and say, hey, I'm Stacey Beers and I would like to, um, I would like, you know, to claim, you know, Sam Jones. And they would let me do that. Now I'm like, okay, that's a little, that's something. <laughs> but I think because of the volume that they have, that's why they do that. Um, so saying all that, um, I think it really depends on your jurisdiction. Um, Nancy, great question. What if the family asks you to notify others? You decide what it is to do. Um, you know, you. I don't think it's a good practice to notify like 10 people. Like there may be, if you have a situation where Eileen was asking, you know, you may have a situation related to two parents or, you know, maybe two partners, whatever the case may be, children all around the US, that could be something. But there comes a point in time, you know, you want to ask if there's anybody for you to notify. We had one time where somebody said that their loved one was in prison in Hawaii and could we notify them? And we did. You know, we had our victim specialist work it out and notify them. But I think there comes a point in time where you've done what you you've set out to do. And so um, you, you kind of want to ask that question, but you don't want to have to. Um, you know, go all over, you know, to, to do that. But, you know, again, when it comes to follow-up, the folks that are doing follow-up may be able to ask that question as well. Eileen, great question. If next of kin is suspect or family member of next of kin, maybe how does that impact what you share? Um, I think that it impacts a lot of what you share. And this is when you want to be lockstep with your detectives uh, because 
yes, you want to notify them of the the, the deceased, you know, the, the homicide, um, but uh, maybe not so much after that. So that is definitely, I, I take my lead from our investigators, like before I even do a death notification, until we get the green light to do it, we don't launch. And so when you have a situation like this, I think that's really, really important to definitely make sure that you are lockstep with your investigators. The last thing we want to be doing is screwing that up. So um, that's my suggestion. Richard, are there other questions? Yeah, one more. And I think you touched on this one as well a little bit earlier. Uh, but the question is, can you speak a little bit about how you handle issues when next of kin may have conflict with other family members? If yeah. there are two parents uh, that are not speaking to each other, uh, and it says a wife and a mother of a victim who are not in a speaking terms. So I think those were two different yeah. scenarios that they touched on. Just Yeah. And that what I would suggest is having a team for each. Um, you know, the wife, Ideally, I mean, the wife would probably have um, the the legal jurisdiction to make decisions. So that gets messy. But you know what? Once you do the notification, now those of us who are victim advocates that work with these families forever, that's that's a dicey issue for us. But when it comes to doing a death notification, each one of them gets a a, a team. Actually, the the legal next of kin is ma is, is is the wife. So she would be the one to do the death. She would be the one to get the death notification. Now, if she says. Uh, my mother-in-law needs to know, I would get a different team and have the them do that, you know, and if it's a telephonic notification or a remote notification, you have a different jurisdiction doing that. So that's what I would suggest. Any other questions? I think we have just one more. Um, and this is actually for me. <laughs> um, Stacey, if you don't mind just touching briefly on the importance of community engagement and working with local organizations who serve victims of crime um, in the respective uh, communities or backgrounds, and just talk about how important that is to trauma-informed and compassionate death notifications, I think that would uh, move us really nicely into our, our next section of the training. Absolutely. And I, I think it goes without saying, you know, community engagement and we talk about a community approach, you know, I think that, and I was talking about this, Richard, with you the other day that, you know, we are part of community, we are not the community. And so I think sometimes it's helpful to look at things in the, with the lens of how can we build relationships in the community so that um, when things happen, like we're in partnership with one another. And so a lot of, like, this is a good example, doing this kind of training, is like, look, look at how many people from different agencies are on this and different community groups. Knowing your resources and knowing your community partners in advance is key because you're the vessel for information to the, that community, right? You can often be the bridge um, to that community. And so this is a perfect example of how to do that. So we're talking about death notification today, but there's other kind of crimes and there's other kind of agencies that help with sexual assault, domestic violence, right? How, how can we be on um, different groups with them? Are there MDTs or multidisciplinary teams that folks can participate on? So if you're not part of those things, it really does help um, you know, get in the community. Looking at the community groups in the aftermath of homicides specifically, um, I worked outside of Philadelphia for many years, and there was a lot of organizations in the community that specifically worked with homicide survivors. And so we would go out and talk with them. We would go to the churches. We would go to where they are. And that's the other thing. Oftentimes when we work with communities, we expect them to come to us. It doesn't work that way. We need to go to them. We need to be part of their community. Going to you know their community events, whether it's a uh, community yard sale or a national night out or all those kind of things is really, really critical because the last time, the last, the last thing you want to do is when you are working a homicide is trying to figure it out. Like, okay, who, who do I need to talk with? Um, what can, who are the community leaders here? Um, you want to have that in advance. And so it, it really does you a disservice. It certainly does a disservice to the crime victims in your community if you don't know um, who those groups are in advance. And that's why I said, you know, we always talk in law enforcement about response. We're so response heavy. 
um, we don't often take the time to do a lot of planning and preparedness. And so that is like, this is the start of this. Um, and actually Cleveland, you started this a couple years ago when I came out and did this training before, and I'm sure you're doing these things, um, in other venues. My point is, is that we need to go where the community is. We need to start to build bridges or solidify the bridges. Um, and really ask the community, what do you need? What would be helpful? Ask them what it is. Um, and so really kind of start there. So I hope, does that answer the question, Richard? That was the perfect answer, Stacey. Great. Awesome. Um, so it looks like we are running a little ahead of schedule. So we'll take about a, a six minute break and we'll come back at 1125 for our panelists of community organizations and agencies. Stacy, thank you for uh, a excellent presentation. We've been in contact over the last couple of months and it's always nice to hear your voice and hear your feedback in, in, in statements on emerging topics in the victim services field. So I appreciate you uh, for presenting today. Um, we will have another Q&A session at 12 o'clock. So just stick around for us and I'm sure we'll have a few more questions for you. That's great. Thank you, everybody. All right, so we'll come back at 11.25, everyone.
Hey, welcome back, everyone. We will now move into our uh, community organization and agency section. We will first have uh, Ms. Eileen Zeta, who will uh, give a brief presentation and programmatic overview, as well as uh, go over any services that uh, her organization uh, can provide. So Eileen, I'll turn over things over to you. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody, again, for being part of this. And um, I definitely found um, it's always helpful to listen to, you know, Dr. Beers and what she has to share with us um, about notification. I know my staff, even though, you know, we've all done them, um, anytime you can kind of think through a unique scenario, um, it's very, very helpful to prepare you for the next time, you know, something comes up that you haven't necessarily done before. So I really appreciate the information already shared. And um, what we want to make sure, you know, within our local community here in Cleveland and in Cuyahoga County, um, for anyone uh, who might be um, encountering a family member of a homicide victim or a witness to a homicide, to know what resources are available to them. So um, my team at Frontline Service, the Traumatic Loss Response Team, um, we work in partnership very closely with the Cleveland Homicide Detectives. Um, certainly we're available to other um, cities and suburbs of Cleveland um, if they have a homicide um, in their community. And then we also are partnered with um, the Prosecutor Office um, Advocates and the Witness Victim Service Center um, to provide the advocacy for the criminal justice process. But what I want to focus on is... Um, what we, what we do uh, when a referral is, is made to the traumatic loss response team. So we are different than victim advocates in that our team are considered the crisis intervention specialists. So our team is made up of, um, we actually have myself and um, five workers who there's three different roles between, um, between our workers. So we have three crisis intervention specialists who they actually are the ones who, when we receive a referral, which is hopefully within, you know, the first 24 hours of, of it happening, um, that they are responding um, immediately to the families so that all that time sensitive stuff, um, we can make our resources available to them. And so um, they actually go out into the community. They're available to go wherever the families are. Um, really 95 not 99% of what we do is actually in people's homes. Um, so we just want to try to remove any barriers at this time. We've also found that it's helpful for us to go to them in that we might just know about one next of kin when the referral is made to us. But when we go out and respond to their home, we're able to identify other family members or people who are um, you know, deeply impacted by what happens so that we can work with them as well. Um, and so we are the three crisis intervention specialists. They're the ones who get the assigned cases for anything new that comes in. Um, we also have one ongoing therapist. Um, so she is available. Uh, we keep her for um, really the most, um, the most difficult cases um, and the people who um, are unlikely to be able to access um, therapy services. Um, that's community, you know, that's, uh, outpatient, um, so because she goes in home as well. So um, when a referral is made to us by a 24-hour hotline, so we receive referrals either that um, a police officer, a hospital, um, sometimes children and family services, um, as soon as they receive, you know, information on the family, that they can call the 24-hour hotline um, and provide that information to us in terms of just basic demographics, a little bit about the incident, um, if we need to know something about if there's a safety concern um, and where they would like us to go. And then we can head out um, to see the families. What the crisis intervention specialists offer when they go out is um, just based on what the family need is. Um, so we are available to help with that real grassroots practical stuff with all the hoops they have to jump through with the information they need, um, you know, if they're navigating different systems than they've never been involved in before, um, you know, how to lay their loved one to rest. Um, if there's children, you know, if there's minor children of a victim um, and something needs to happen in juvenile court as far as custody, um, how do we steer them through that process? Um, you know, enrolling in a different school, all those different things that come up. We wanna be available for the practical information. But because of our crisis intervention specialists are all licensed mental health professionals, 
um, we're also available to do that real um, acute uh, trauma and um, crisis counseling with families. And so they utilize the, model, the models of um, psychological first aid, which is really a model that's based on those first 72 hours and what are all the needs that come up, both practical and, um, you know, uh, clinical issues that come up. Um, and then for the, the weeks and months to come, you know, right after homicide in those first, you know, three months or so, um, we're using skills for psychological recovery as uh, one of the models to be um, aiming our interventions at for those that are ready and, and wanting to be able to talk about um, what, what their experience is as far as how it's impacted them emotionally. So they are, you know, trained and ready to help with, you know, not just the grief and the sadness and the loss in their lives, um, but every family that experiences a homicide has now experienced um, a trauma and that that can complicate the grieving factor in that um, it's not just missing them. It's the picture um, of what happened to them stuck in their head. And that doesn't mean that they have to have witnessed it. Sometimes it can just be what they imagined happened to them. Um, it can be that sense of hypervigilance and is it safe to go outside and is this going to happen to somebody else in my family? Um, and so anything that's related to trauma, um, they're available to kind of help with interventions with that. And then we also know that this really impacts the worldview um, that families have. And um, is this a safe place to be? What, what if they've lost the role, you know, of, of who they are in this world? If they've lost the spouse, they've lost a child. Um, so how that impacts the, the world around them. So we wanna be able to help with those things, with the worldview, with the grief and with the trauma. So um, the other um, reason that it's kind of helpful to have licensed mental health professionals is some of the things that come up immediately um, is that there's sometimes there's a higher risk for some suicidal ideation. And so um, everybody is trained in risk assessment and can also help determine the level of care, um, either if somebody is expressing suicidal thoughts. Um, and it's, you know, it's very, very normal to long to be with the person to feel like I don't know how I'm going to live without them. Um, but when it kind of crosses into that um, area of I'm actively thinking um, about ending my life, um, you know, our staff are available to figure out how to help them, um, you know, get the level of care they need to address those thoughts, um, or family members are worried for somebody else in their family that's experiencing those thoughts. Um, and, you know, and the same is true if there's some um, homicidal ideation and, you know, there's certainly talk of retaliation and, and risk, but if there feels like there's a mental health component to that risk, um, our, our workers are able to do what they need to do to kind of help with the mental health intervention that needs to happen immediately. Um, the other reason that's helpful to have licensed mental health professionals is some of our families, um, their functioning is so um, just gravely impacted by what's happened and it might be hard to return to work and they might need help filling out FMLA paperwork um, or sometimes short-term disability um, if they're unable to return to work. Um, so being a licensed professional, you're able to do an assessment on them, a diagnostic assessment where you can comment on their ability to return to work if they just need a little bit of time or they need some flexibility. Um, so those are some things um, that you know, are different than um, an advocate that's helping them navigate the criminal justice process. It's uh, mental health workers. Um, and sometimes people are already linked with therapists or they're not all that interested in having somebody come out and talk to them about the emotional stuff and they just need to know um, how to, you know, uh, contact the medical examiner's office and how to get things set up for a funeral. And they're really just focused on the practical. They can choose what they need from us. So everybody is open with us for at least the first 90 days, as long as they want to. Um, and then if there's specific needs um, that uh, are related to the homicide um, past 90 days, they don't need to close and be really, we can continue to work with them until some of that real, um, that first mountain that they have to climb that we've um, tried to address those issues with them. Um, the other role that I wanna make sure that I'm talking about um, is um, a unique role that we have with one of our crisis intervention specialists that is uh, co-located with the detectives. Um, that changed for a bit during the pandemic, um, but she's you know, kind of moving back to, um, to being there um, actually in the office with them. And so for those of you that know, um, 
Grace Leon and the detectives kind of talk about Grace as being part of TLRT all the time as well. But um, she's the person that actually has, um, she works as a liaison to the de detectives for all the new cases that come in, that if it's hard to reach the detectives um, or they have some questions or the crisis intervention specialists who are assigned to them have questions about the investigation, it kind of all um, can go through uh, Grace who's, who's there. Um, she also has a very important role for doing follow-ups and check-ins with family members of unsolved homicides so that they know they're not forgotten about. And she keeps a big spreadsheet about birthdays and anniversaries and um, other dates of significance so that she's sure to be checking in with them um, and can pass along information um, to detectives and then can also get updates from detectives and family members. Um, and then um, she also has a role where she's providing the information to the victim advocates. So like that early on, um, she can provide the information that the detectives have about contact information for next of kin so that advocates can be assigned um, as, as early on in the process as, um, as possible. So that um, sometimes there is an arrest very early and families, the criminal justice process is gonna get going and other times there's not an arrest, um, but they might still have some questions about the criminal justice process itself. So that's kind of my um, segue into uh, um, our partnership with the victim advocates. Um, so I believe Jeanette um, is the next person up and can kind of explain um, her role through the prosecutor's office. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jeanette Pellot Ayala, and I am the Victim Witness Unit Supervisor here at the um, Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office. I am going to share my screen here with you. Okay. Um, bear with me just a moment. Okay. So like I said, I am the Victim Witness Unit Supervisor here at the Prosecutor's Office. And the unit is basically embedded in the Prosecutor's Office to provide support to victims and their families and assist them through the criminal justice system. We work right along with um, Eileen. So when there's a homicide that happens, Eileen and her team is um, basically on it. And once um, the perpetrator has been caught, the case is then um, transferred over over here and it goes to the grand jury and once it hits the grand jury that's when we pick it up so once the case is indicted that's when the um, Cuyahoga County Victim Witness Unit gets involved. Our unit is um, ba basically consists of six full-time advocates um, and they are trained in domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, and helping families and survivors of homicide victims and here are their um, their faces, and I just I wanted to put pictures of them because um, you may see us walking around in the justice center, um, and I just wanted you to know, like, put a name to the face, um, and so that way, if you see them, just say hello. <laughs> um, they are they are very hard workers, and they are um, they're passionate about serving victims. Um, I do want to specify that Sophia and Pauline only work sexual assault cases. And they are specifically in the sexual assault kid initiative unit. Um, so they mostly handle sexual assault. Anita, Susan, Toby, and Valentina are working uh, mostly criminal cases, especially homicide cases. And like I said, they're very dedicated and um, they are in contact with the, um, the victims and witnesses um, throughout the pendency of the case. And they all have a collective expertise um, in the areas of criminal justice, social work, domestic violence, sexual assault, trauma, crisis intervention, mental health, training and grieving, training and working with grieving homicide families. And I think that's very important. One of the many questions that we get um, is that, what is the difference between the community-based advocacy program and the system-based um, advocacy? Um, since we are embedded in the prosecutor's office, we are the system-based advocacy program. And so the differences are kind of mild. We do a lot of the things that are basically the same as you will notice when Jada give her presentation because we work right along with Jada. 
um, with witness victim services. But you, there's also some differences. Um, so the difference between the community-based advocacy and system-based advocacy is basically um, that community-based advocacy provides services to victims at any time. So the case does not have to be indicted in order for them to get involved. They get involved, they can get involved right away. Um, and we, as the system-based advocacy program, we only get indicted once a case is indicted um, and, it's, and it's finished. Um, Community-based advocacy has no limitation in services. Um, so like I said, well, since they get involved from the beginning, um, they can provide more resources and services than we can. Uh, our services are kind of limited, um, but we do try to help the victims as much as we can. Um, the victim decides when the services end um, in the community-based advocacy program. Um, basically is based is volunteer. So if the victim does not want to engage with them with the community agency that they don't have to, but with the system based advocacy works slightly different. We are required by law to notify the victims of the process of the case and the status of the case so that that's where there's a slight change in to um, our roles. Um, the community-based advocacy is victim-centered and we, the system-based advocacy, we're both victim and prosecution-centered. So we kind of, we have to balance both sides um, and it's just part of our role. And sometimes it can be challenging, um, but at the same time, um, we can't change the law. So therefore we try to help victims as much as we can through this process. Um, and another um, and last, kind of like change that there is between community and base is that um, com community-based advocacy, they have confidentiality, confidentiality agreements with the victims and witnesses. So they don't have to tell the prosecution or the prosecutors um, any information that the victim shares with them. And in terms, we as advocates in the, within the prosecutor's office, um, we have to inform the, uh, the prosecutors of any information that the victim provides to us. So there's a few um, there's a few differences and there's a few um, things that are the same um, as as you will see. We have some partner ag agencies. We partner with Frontline, with Eileen. We work close with Eileen, with Witness Victim Services, um, as Jada is going to explain right after me. Um, we work with the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center. We work with Journey, which is used to be the Domestic Violence and Child Advocacy Center. We work with Canopy, which is the Child Advocacy Center, the Ohio Crime Victim Justice Center, and Asia. Um, Asia is a community um, agency who helps victims um, that are basically um, that are have special needs and they are very um, they're from other countries, specifically Asian. And I just put here um, the role of our advocates. And we basically support victims throughout the criminal justice process. We help victims understand their rights as a victim um, or their victim representatives. We discuss and connect victims with resources. Um, we act as liaison between victims and law enforcement and prosecutors. We provide support during court proceedings and we explain um, safety and planning and civil, pro and civil protection orders. Um, we do civil protection orders here in the office with victims, but it can be time consuming. And we usually referred victims to the uh, witness victim services for, um, to assist with the civil protection order. And the reason why is because they're so time consuming. And we are so bombarded with cases that sometimes it's just too much for our advocates to handle. So um, I know witness victim services provides um, that specific um, service and it's easier for them. So that's why we transferred over some of those civil protection orders to them. Um, we assist with facilitating the victim impact statement when a victim is getting ready to um, for sentencing. Um, we usually assist victim in preparing their statement as to what they want to see happen to the defendant and how the case or the, the crime impacted their lives. And that's very um, impactful because Victims can get so emotional sometimes that they can't even read their statement. So we are there to assist them through the process. And if they cannot read it, then we'll go ahead and read it for them. 
Um, we assist with um, victims of crime conversation applications. And we also assist with registration with VINE and the Ohio Department of Rehabilitations and Corrections. And I just put on here basically uh, Marcy's Laws. Um, in 2017, the, um, not, I wouldn't say new, but they, um, they clarify some laws for victims. Um, and these are some of them. Um, the right to be treated with respect, fairness, and dignity, the right to information, uh, the right to notification, the right to be present, the right to be heard, and the right to institution, to restitution, restitution, I'm so sorry. And here's my contact information. And if anybody has any questions, if not, I will transfer it over to Jada who will be speaking about her role. Jada? You're on mute. There yes, you I am. Hi, how are you? Good morning, I'm Jada Patterson. Um, I'm a Justice System Advocate Supervisor here at Cuyahoga County Witness Victim Service Center. I am going to share my screen and I will go over the services that um, our agency provides and I will also go over the role of a uh, major trial um, justice system advocate. Okay. Please let me know if you're able to see my screen. At one point we were able to see it and now the screen is no longer up. Please let me know if you're able to see my screen. Hi Jada, can you hear me? Yes. At one point we were able to see your screen at this point we cannot. Okay, just one second. In the meantime, while we are uh, giving uh, Ms. Patterson a second, if you have any questions for any of our panelists, uh, feel free to add those into our chat. Uh, we will go into a Q&A session later. Um, so if you have any questions at this time, feel free to drop them in the chat. Hi, are you able to see my screen at this point? We yes, can see we you, are. Jada, thanks. Okay, thank you. Hi, so I'm Jada. I'm a justice system advocate supervisor. Um, I work closely with uh, Eileen from Frontline Traumatic Loss Response Team and Jeanette over at the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's uh, Office. Over, just a quick overview of our agency. We provide um, justice system advocacy to crime victims in the city of Cleveland Municipal Court, Cuyahoga County Juvenile Court, and Cuyahoga County Common Police Court. We have a domestic violence high risk team project. We also have children who witness violence and defendant childhood. And we have an array of service providers located here at the Family Justice Center. The uh, service providers include Frontline Traumatic Re Response Team, Frontline Service Center, Journey Center for Safety and Healing, Cleveland Rape Crisis, City of Cleveland Police Department, the City of Cleveland Prosecutor's Office, the Cuyahoga County Prosecutor's Office and the Legal Aid Society of Cleveland. We also offer Safe at Home, which is the Ohio Secretary of State Address Confidentiality Program. The role of a major trial homicide advocate um, here at Witness Victim Service Center is all of our services are voluntary and we utilize a victim-centered advocacy approach to engage the co-victims of homicide cases. Now, when we speak about victim-centered approach, we are talking about our services are solely focused on the needs, the desires, and the wants of um, the co-victims of the homicide case. We um, know that they have their right to choose, they're autonomous, and they can express, you know, when they don't want to cooperate or don't wish to receive our services because our services are voluntarily and we will respect their wishes. 
Another part about the co-victims uh, of homicide cases is that co-victims of homicide cases can be just the loved ones of the um, person of the deceased. Um, so anyone who expresses an interest in our services, we provide services to. We typically get a next to kin notification from um, Grace Leon and the Frontline Traumatic Loss Response Team. Also, we of course, we work in collaboration with Frontline. We assist them, co-victims of homicide cases well before charges may even be filed. So prior to any type of court cases, identification of suspects, we're involved and we receive a direct referral from Frontline Traumatic Loss Response Team. We also receive referrals through our um, regular office, through our FJC. We discussed and developed safety plans with victims of um, homicide cases, co-victims. We also ensure that they are informed of their rights and that the rights are upheld throughout the criminal justice process. We serve as a liaison and we coordinate between the co-victims of homicide cases, police, prosecutors, and court personnel. We also assist the co-victors of homicide cases with completing victims of crime compensation application. Another major um, focus of the, the role of the major trial homicide victim advocate is just to assist throughout the entire case with navigating the criminal justice system and understanding the court, the criminal court information, even prior to a criminal case would even um, begin. We also um, provide advocacy and meetings with the criminal prosecutors. We accompany uh, co-victims to court and provide advocacy to them throughout the uh, case, throughout the court trial and the sentencing. We assist the victims of homicide cases with preparing victim impact statements. Um, we also link them with uh, the Ohio Vine Victim Information and Notification Everyday Service. We also prepare and provide information on civil stocking and protection orders. And we link the co-victims of homicide cases to resources in the community. So that's an overview of the services that we provide and the role of a, a major trial advocate at Witness Victim. Does anyone have any questions for me? Great, thank you so much for, for all of this helpful feedback. We did have one question and I think this is for our larger group. Um, and the question is, how do you approach a person that has, compli has a complicated trauma experience? So I think anyone really can answer that. So um, I can kind of certainly talk in generalities, but um, whoever's question that was, um, if there is a scenario or something that I don't, you know, touch on um, with my answer, then by all means, you can clarify, you know, anything further. But um, I, I guess, you know, we, we have to assume all of us, any of us who are on this, um, you know, webinar, it's probably because we um, have some role with uh, family members of a homicide. So that automatically means that they have experienced trauma. And unfortunately, for a lot of these families that we interact with, this isn't necessarily the first traumatic experience they've been with, um, especially if they have, um, you know, uh, experienced poverty in their past or um, a lack of access to resources, um, you know, or who've been, um, you know, somehow denied opportunities and access to things. Um, it can complicate um, their ability to, to deal with trauma. So we, you know, we talk about um, some of the families that we see in the traumatic loss response team, like, you know, for instance, um, when there's a tragic accident and it's a, um, you know, a car accident um, might be what we call kind of like a type one trauma where this is the, an individual um, experience and they might not have had a whole lot of other loss in their lives. But um, for a number of our families that experience homicide, um, they might have a long history of being impacted by violence um, and, and frankly, um, not have always had um, a positive experience with the criminal justice process or might be, um, you know, hesitant to trust law enforcement for whatever reason. So um, I think we all have to be aware of that, you know, as we're thinking about death notification, you know, from the moment we are 
walking up to their door, we don't know necessarily yet what their history is. Um, so we have to kind of um, approach it that everybody, every single person that we're going to interact with, we're giving them the worst information they're ever going to receive in their life. And they might have already had a number of hard things happening to them. So I think it's important for us not to personalize um, any reactions that seem, you know, negative to either our profession or, um, you know, to even if it feels like a personal insult that um, it might be rooted in bad experiences from the past. Um, I think for us to kind of always be looking through the lens of um, this is a trauma uh, that we have to recognize that um, any reaction that we get um, might make sense given their history. You know, it might not always be what we're expecting, um, but if we don't know their history yet, we don't know my, why they might kind of have the outward reaction that they're having. Um, and I really liked uh, the list of, I, I always think it's helpful anytime you have a training to kind of talk about the what do you say and what do you are kind of some pitfall situations. So I found that list of pitfalls by Dr. Beers to be very, very helpful um, and important reminders. And, um, you know, I think in um, remembering that, uh, that our families are going to have, you know, kind of a whole range. Not everybody, just because they're not calling us back, doesn't mean that they're not going through a hard time or even necessarily okay. So the importance of continuing to check in um, and not just assuming that there aren't needs because they're not ringing our phone off the hook. Um, I think, but then we have those families who are ringing our phone off the hook and they're angry and they're hurting and they're um, sometimes can be really, really difficult to deal with. And so um, you know, just again, remembering that this is trauma and not personal, but, um, you know, knowing when our boundaries have to be, um, you know, that, that there still has to be kind of a level of respect, you know, between um, those conversations and, you know, try and give them some outlines of how often, you know, we may be able to give responses and how often we can get back to them. Um, but everybody wants to feel like their loved one is important and valued. Um, there's a really, really, I, I find it interesting. I always talk about this book, but, um, it's actually called ghetto side. I forget what the rest of the title is. And right now I'm forgetting the author, but, um, I think it's a really interesting book for anybody who does this work. Um, because it's a real, it's actually a journalist that is trying to follow, um, de homicide detectives, um, and, uh, you know, the experience of the families that they, they work with. And, um, it really does try to get to understand the source of um, why some families react the way they do. Um, and um, also, you know, the effectiveness of, of homicide detectives and trying to kind of look through things for their lens too and, and um, how hard they're working, but at the same time, um, how difficult it, it can be to do this day in and day out. Um, so, that's I'm totally getting off topic um, about that, but uh, I just, you know, approaching everything through a trauma lens um, and being patient with the process and not necessarily, you know, assuming that we understand what it's like to stand in their shoes. Thank you so much for that, Eileen. That was powerful and, and you gave such really nuanced and thoughtful answers to that. Um, and, and we are also opening this time up too. If folks have any last minute questions for Stacy or any of our, our great panelists, feel free to put those in the chat. We did have a question. If we can get Jeanette's information, uh, contact information again, that would be helpful. Um, and then uh, I see Richard answered the question. Someone wanted the name of the book again, and I believe the name is Ghetto Side, A True Story of Murder in America. Um, so those are some of our, our last questions. If there are no other questions, um, as always, you can reach out to Richard um, with those and we can get them to the appropriate um, uh, panelists and um, we will be sending out follow-up information uh, after the webinar with more information, uh, the recording information, as well as any other resources cited in today's training. As always, you may go to our PSNTTA.org uh, website if you need uh, project-specific training and technical assistance. And if you have any questions uh, that our PSN team can answer, feel free to go to PSN 
PTTA team at psntta.org. If there are no other questions, we thank you all for joining us today, and we hope you have a pleasant rest of your day. Thank you.